Good evening, Patreons, and good evening, all listeners, to today's episode of Red Moon Roleplaying. Today, a half-orc down on his luck, and a slightly depressed priest meet in a tavern. A storm's brewing outside, and who knows what awaits them. Mm. I look into the fire. I feel depression co- coming over me. It feels heavy. I open the Dr. Pepper. I pour and it into you, a glass. Half orc, Yalmar. What do you do? I uh, sit on my chair, and then I stand up for a bit, and then I sit down again. And then I stand up. Roll me a dexterity check. That's far right, too right, much right. movement that's, going on there. Forty-six. Excellent. You do, as you said, standing up and down so many times that everyone applauds and our adventure comes to an end. Well done. Well done. Good That's work, everyone. one million experience points. Yes. So... That's the end of the adventure. How did we feel about it? And by that, perhaps we'll move into how we felt about the other adventure as well, maybe. Oh, yes, there was another adventure. Oh, the adventure. other one, yes, that mm. one. Mm. Yeah. Wow, it's been such a long journey. It was uh, longer than the Black Madonna. We ended up with, uh, what was it, 20, 21, 21 sessions? 21 sessions. 21 sessions, yes, which is funny, because I think at one point I thought it'd be much shorter. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. That's what we all thought. Yeah, exactly. It's been uh, been a very long journey through the land of Barovia, and we've met so many characters along the way and done so many things. It's been, yeah, it's really been a journey, and it's so weird that it's over. Um, I'm sure you must have felt something similar with the Black Madonna, but this is like, yeah, like half a year has passed mm. somehow. Yeah. yeah, it's weird thinking back, like, how how long a time period you just span with this and how how long it's sort of been a part of your life. I mean, it's... Uh, <laughs> and it's going to be an even longer part for you, Craig, who will keep editing the episodes mm-hmm. for a good while after yes, this. Yes, yes. Well, we're nearly... <laughs> nearly halfway. Nearly. <laughs> but it's still cool, I mean, how, it, how, how, how big it can be, you know, in, in one's life. Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And I don't regret a moment of it. It's been really fun, sometimes stressful... Never because of you guys, more because of my own self-perfectionism where I've been a bit like, Oh, I hope this is good. Oh, I hope that's not bad. Oh, I hope this doesn't seem rushed or rubbish. Uh, I've had a few nights like that. And then obviously Mm. it's always been good. It's always been great. And I've generally been really happy with how things have turned out. Especially so far, listeners, with the feedback you've given. It's really good to hear people are enjoying it, basically. Indeed, yes. There's been uh, tons of of positive feedback and... uh, yeah, I think I think we have hopefully been able to show how um, you can play Dungeons and Dragons in maybe a little bit of a different way than uh, than you're otherwise used to, and how it can very much um, be narrative, how it can very much be, you know, developing interesting uh, and deep characters. Mm. And I think mm. you've done a really good job, sort of balancing both the how should I say the the more combat uh, combaty dice rolly parts with the narrative side and and still kept it you know still kept it uh, to to what the game is supposed to be but i think we'll talk yeah. even more about that uh, maybe uh, as we as we move further on into uh, into the questions that we have for indeed. today yeah. indeed so perhaps we'll follow as we did our last post mortem viewers we kind of broke it down into a few score questions and then we discussed things around those so we'll start off with how did you feel when we started the campaign, Matthias? Um, in the beginning, I think I felt a little bit... Um, I knew so little, you know? Um, I knew who my character was, but I really didn't know that much about where we were going to end up. I think we had, for the Black Madonna, we had talked a little bit more about um, sort of maybe the starting point... But here we sort of we started. We did the start in the tavern, this classic uh, role-playing trope, mm-hmm. um, and then sort of getting to meet Roshik there, who was this character who I had. I mean, I knew he was a half-orc fighter, but that was essentially all I knew about him. 
So at, at first there, it was very, very sort of exciting and like not really knowing what to expect and sort of not really knowing. I mean, obviously I knew we were going to end up in in the Dread Realms, in, in Barovia, in the, you know, Ravenloft. I knew we were headed there, but I had no idea really how it was going to happen and how quickly perhaps also it was going to happen. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it, it was very much a, a feeling of anticipation and excitement and like this, yeah, finally going to get to to play on the show, which was which was fun, um, and getting to go into this really classic world um, that is so beloved and I've heard so much about but I uh, have never touched. I mean, I've barely gotten to play Dungeons & Dragons in, in, in general, so getting to do that was was something that was super, super exciting. So that, I think that's how I felt uh, there in the beginning. Um, and I think the, the beginning was very strong, I felt, with all these different voices that you were you were making and and um, these very very distinct characters that you were able to create i was really i was really positively surprised because i had no idea what you were capable of obviously um so it was yeah it was a really really cool feeling hmm. what yeah. about you yamar well uh yeah i i agree with that uh i i didn't realize um until well, I, I started getting hints when we talked about that we wanted to do this. No, I don't know. When did I actually start getting hints that people really, really loved Ravenloft? I think that was sort of a, a bit into the adventure, really, when we started really releasing releasing the episodes. Uh, because I was I was thinking the same thing, that now that we have sort of a um, cult following, uh, how, how will they react to us doing something that is feels a bit more mainstream perhaps uh, and I, I I felt that I was a bit nervous about um, not knowing like you say the setting properly enough to, to be able to play my character uh, so I think what I just did was to sort of bring in things from what I did know which was like uh, stuff from the Neverwinter Nights games and st- you know just build upon the little I had from Faerun, uh for that, and then obviously I didn't need to know that much because we were taken into a, a completely different plane. Uh, but yeah, I was, I was wondering how it would be to run uh, a pen and paper D and D for the first time, which it was for me, and uh, if we could bring our idea of horror and a dark world into that, and uh, yeah, but the, the enthusiasm that people showed. Uh, and uh, I think uh, one that really mattered was that uh, uh, Pesanalo was so <laughs> enthusiastic, who is uh, like the cult man himself. Like, yes, you're going to play Ravenloft. And I'm like, oh, it, fe- it felt almost like having the blessing of someone that <laughs> uh, that was already behind the show, sort of. I don't know. It was. It, it felt. It felt good. No, that was definitely awesome. Um... I definitely was excited when we started. Uh, I was a little concerned at times. I was at the time really worried because uh, it was my first, this has been my first proper D&D GM position. I've never done this much, never mind a whole campaign. Uh, I was a bit concerned about things like mm. balancing the rules. I very much wanted to have them involved because I was like, well, you know, we mm. are playing D&D. At the end of the day, you have to have some aspect of the rules. Otherwise, what's the point? Um, but I was very worried about balancing because, again, obviously, mm. this is an adventure designed for recommended player count four and above. Like, oh, yeah, most oh, of these yeah. encounters will be fine for four players, maybe five. And I was like, oh, there's only two of them. How are we going to do this? And also, I didn't want there to be as much combat as there is because, again, it's fine when you're playing around the table with your friends that once a week, then you can have as many fights as you want. But obviously, for our purposes, I was like, oh, I don't want there to be, like, random goblin encounters every five minutes so i you know mm, no. which things am i gonna have which things will i remove uh but i was very excited about the setting uh i was very much a fan of it it was definitely one of the things that interested me and i'll admit i probably wasn't into ravenloft as much before running this adventure as i am now um since yes. running it i've then read older modules and i've actually been quite interested in the old way of doing things um i've read um but via uh our recommendations guys i have myself looked at castles forlorn and uh feast of globelins and i both thought they're quite fun adventures 
some parts mm-hmm. definitely needed changing if you were ever going to run them in a modern fifth edition setting. <laughs> but uh, but the core behind them, the idea of these tragic stories, I think that's the idea of Ravenloft in a way. It's supposed to be the idea of trying to fit in like almost the Shakespearean idea of a tragedy into Dungeons mm. and Dragons. And how it doesn't have to be, oh, everything sucks and you're doomed and no one is happy. Like You can still have hope, you can still have victory, but it's yeah. always just in the framework of a tragedy. Like, maybe you win, but maybe you didn't. That sort of thing. Yeah. Yeah, and I mean, that's something that I very much um, appreciate about this particular setting, because for mo- most of the other Dungeons and Dragons settings, I've always felt that they're a little bit too American high fantasy, too much... Uh, you know, crazy wizards and, and goblins, and uh, it's fun, you know? It's fun role-playing, but it's not necessarily, like, emotionally gripping uh, normally. At least yeah. that's what I've, I've felt. Um, it can be done right, though. I mean, I have a lot of fond memories from, you know, Baldur's Gate, uh, those games, where, yeah, it, it is possible to, to make something interesting, but, but there's a lot of, you know, combat and... and um, it's it's such a mishmash of different things going on, so it doesn't have sort of that that uh, that sort of through line theme that uh, um, the other games that we have or the other game that we had played before, like Cult, uh, that that has. So I, I was a little bit, um, I, I think I was a little bit uh, concerned, but it, it turned out that it wasn't. There was no concern needed, and and I, I suppose Yalmar, I think you touched on it as well the, the reception from mm. the listeners because I, I know that Dungeons and Dragons is I think there's a lot of people out there who sort of look down on Dungeons and Dragons especially if they're playing other games just because it is so big it's this behemoth this uh, this thing that crushes everything else in terms of sales and yeah. it is focused on rolling and it's focused on combat and like, could we really make this into something that would be comparable to what we did before mm. and I, I think probably a few of the listeners were also worried about that and uh, yeah. I think what we've seen and felt is that it is possible so um, well done on that Craig really thank you really, really and cool. again I will also give kudos to the adventure itself because honestly the adventure is a popular adventure because it's got such a strong narrative pull because it's got a great sandbox element so it doesn't feel like you're being railroaded or hopefully it shouldn't most of the time um and again because it says it's different it is part of and i think fifth edition especially is i think trying to acknowledge that now as it goes forward trying to acknowledge that oh yeah there are differences in the older supplements of DD where there were whole loads of settings that were different they weren't all Faerun, there was Dark Sun, there was Ravenloft, there was Eberron, there was, um, you know, uh, quite a few other ones that were just different, different sorts of ideas, mm-hmm. and they were mm. equally as popular at the time. And yeah, it'd be cool to see them come back, and I think maybe they will, in some form or the other. I think so too, because I think one of the things that we are seeing now with the advent of uh, actual play streaming, and really a focus more on characters and stories... This whole storytelling bit, because that also makes it so much more accessible to so many more players, and I think that's what many people are trying to do, like get it easy, easy to get into. Exactly, and it's a thing. Like even the funny ones, like even Critical Role, is at times extremely hilarious, rightfully so, because they're really talented people. But they have that character storytelling moment. They had loads of it, in fact. It's why it's so popular and so kind of one of the shows, not the only one, but one of the shows that really spurred off the whole thing because suddenly people are interested. They're watching these less as just people playing a game and almost watching them in the same vein as when you watch a good TV show or you listen to Mm. a radio show you like. It's applying to that aspect, uh, which has always been there, really. It has always been there, but obviously it's just not always been as forefront. Especially, you know, some guys just want to have fun and kill some goblins, which is totally fine. And... But obviously not that mm. good to listen to sometimes, unless you're very funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. It's like, that. that's, that's how we started. We started carving out our own niche uh, of uh, of listeners, and that's what, uh, yeah made this one a, a little bit scary to uh, to go into and it was interesting you know because we got kind of quite early got on got a demonstration of that the combat system would make combat take a bit longer uh, f- for fighting the vampire for example but 
then again, had we been fighting, you know, uh, some rats, which you would normally do at the start of an adventure, it probably wouldn't have taken as long. Either. No, it wouldn't. And again, um, I mean, I, I knew it and now I've experienced it. The funny thing about 5th edition is, compared to older editions, it's, okay, level 1, level 2, you're not that good. But you're a lot better than they used to be. And when you get to level yeah. 5, 6, 7, 8, you actually become quite competent, as you may yeah. have noticed, where actually I kind of had to pull out some stop to then make things yeah, exactly. challenging. Because sometimes it was like, oh, skeleton, is it any point to not killing them in one hit? Yeah. <laughs> They would have got 15, exactly. 20 health. You could do 15, 20 damage a go. Maybe sometimes you wouldn't do max damage and they'd still live, but then it always felt a bit like, oh, come on. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, yeah, combat is, is, uh, is a tricky balance there, how to, how to get combat to have just the right length to, to both, you know, give it the amount of time that it deserves, but at the same time mm. not... Uh, yeah, not not allowing it to like eat up an entire session or eat up mm. several episodes because that can can quite easily happen, you know, with uh, with combat focused systems like like Dungeons and Dragons. And I think um, in general, the combat, the way I felt it, the combat was kept at a at a decent uh, level of length. Really, yes, mm. I actually ended up being quite happy with how we went with combat. Um, there was only at the very end, maybe one or two encounters I had to really think about, but the first ones I kind of went with my gut, and they actually worked out fine. Sometimes they even worked out better because, again, the magic of the dice roll meant that oh wow, you got a critical hit! Oh, brilliant! Well, that's killed that guy, excellent, great. I don't need to worry about any counter yeah. attacks there. I do think it did help that we had our player count of two because, like, even if you go up to four. You obviously want everyone to have a go and do yeah. something so again that could make battles last just a little bit longer yeah. that's right that's right i mean that's uh, that's certainly a benefit of having a, a low uh, player count and both combat but then also of course in the in the narrative and in the in the interactions um so that's why yeah. i personally am a big fan of keeping it at this level it's how i normally play when i play with my friends as well obviously you know if you add more players you get a little bit of a different dynamic but I think you can really go into depth with each character when there's two. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you can still work with NPCs to sort of add that extra layer layer of, uh, of uh, yeah, something interesting. Exactly. Speaking yeah. of characters and NPCs, let's move on to the next question, mm-hmm. which is, how did you feel about your characters and how they interacted together? Kiyama. Uh, well... <laughs> They're an interesting pair, <laughs> aren't they? <laughs> quite, quite different uh, fellows. My, my, I remember my first impression of, of Roman, uh, which is like, I don't know if it's my impression or if it's Roshik's impression because he was sort of in the role, so it's kind of a, a mix, I guess, uh, is that he was incredibly dramatic, you know, a, 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 almost to a, a point that it, it made him difficult to relate to uh, he was he was this hyper scarred person with a horrible past, but he kept sending himself back there, you know, almost like some sort of self flagellation, you know. It's, it's almost like oh, I, it's so uh, it's like oh, I, I sit and I think and I try to keep my thoughts away, but it's like are you really trying to keep them away? Because it seems almost like it's almost like he he is intentionally punishing himself. Uh, as he comes, what, what do you what do you think about this description, Matthias? Yeah, I mean, certainly in the in the beginning, it was very much I wanted to establish just how sort of tormented and tortured he is, and that he has all these regrets. And yeah. I mean, now that you've heard the end, basically the regrets are not really about anyone preventing him from doing anything. It's really about his own failings and his own weaknesses. Yeah. And, um, and and him not being able to, I guess he really wanted to die with his family. You know, that's he wanted to go there because now life is what is life. There's no purpose really. That's why he's just sitting yeah. around there, uh, you know, drinking in the tavern. Um, so revisiting that felt like an important thing to do in the beginning. I don't know if maybe it was too much, but uh, hopefully that message got through. I think it well, sort I don't of know. I, went I, down I, a little I, I, bit I, I, after that. Just... Yeah, it, it, it was like uh, I don't know. I don't know. I I I would say I wouldn't say that it was. I mean, it was the character, right? Mm-hmm. It's like 
it it was him. That that's that's how he was and how how he related to things and what he did. So I I couldn't. Uh, I mean, it was hard for uh, for Rashek. Uh, I think through the whole thing almost to sort of make up his mind about him if he really liked him or not. He, like he's this he's a strange man mm -hmm. to him, ob ob obsessed with Lathanda almost to a point where. Uh, as we sort of got to in the end there, that w where he'd used the name as, as an excuse to uh, to do whatever he did, really. It's like, it probably has, it probably is, if I do this, it's probably because Lathander wants me to to do it, you know, it's like... Uh, yeah. Yeah, that was really the, the journey that he went on there. And I, I think maybe there, there could be several <laughs> reasons why we sort of ended up uh, getting along in that way. And, and I think mm. one reason com comes from the alignment and trying to sort of play the alignment on some level. Uh, obviously, yeah. Roshek is lawful evil, yes? Yeah. Yeah, and uh, Roman is lawful good. So in yes. theory, this is not the best pairing ever, <laughs> which is yeah, why yeah, yeah. I... Uh, I, I think I also deliberately strayed away from a lot of like moral quandaries or not necessarily yes, charing, yes. challenging uh, Roshek on, <laughs> on making you know, the decisions that he made. Because I, mean, I, mean, that that I mean, that could of course be an interesting conflict yeah. too, but uh, it's, I, 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 I loved how you, how you sort of did that and how he went on to justify things like, because he was full of doubt, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah, and I mean, I think if if uh, we would have worked with like a, a movement in the alignment scale, I mean, I don't think that Roman yeah. was lo lawful good at the end. Uh, certainly no, not. No, he was not. I would definitely agree. Maybe more <laughs> neutral like, good. Yeah. Neutral, yeah, yeah probably yeah, yeah, somewhere yeah, yeah. there, or or perhaps even further down on the neutral scale. Um, no, well, neutral. Breaking the. Yeah. Breaking. Yeah. The, okay, so you would say more like that. He's more like breaking rather than breaking the. Uh, good is rather breaking the the creed, sort of that the laws and stuff that he would should adhere to. What you know, you it's it's a little bit. Diff I think it comes down to, I guess, how you really um, how you work with that alignment scale. But I don't know. It's just some, some something about lawful good feels like it's this this person that really would sacrifice themselves in order to do yeah. sort of good no matter what. It's sort of the paladin uh, alignment and. That is typically what Lathander priests are, uh, but Roman had a little bit more complications, uh, shall we say. He, yeah. might, he might have been lawful neutral, or he might have been, yeah, as you said, maybe neutral good, or, or I don't know, chaotic good even on some level towards the end, especially. I mean, I definitely feel with Roman, it was, a, from my point of view, it was a wonderful case of, I wanted to basically have the scenario of, like, would Roman have done things differently if he was in Faerun? The answer is, of course he would have. In Faerun, yeah. every time he prayed, his god would have answered him in some way. He would have been told immediately when he did something wrong. It would have been a very... And, and the world would have responded to that, because in Faerun there are mm. loads of gods, and they're there. The whole point of Ravenloft mm. is they weren't. So, for me, the descent of Roman more and more thinking, what I'm doing must be right. It's definitely right. I'm not going to question it anymore was fascinating. Yeah. Um, I, and I really thought it was... And it was how you two interacted. You both kind of yeah. came together in my point of view, as two characters who maybe didn't agree with each other at all, but kind of felt that in this moment in time, your goals were the same, and you were going to do whatever it took to achieve them. And you both agreed on that, and that was your common ground. That's how I saw it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. We're going to kill the devil. Yeah, exactly. Going to kill the devil, and uh, I pass yes. my long sword. <laughs> and I nod. <laughs> of course, we're going to do that, because then I have a purpose, and, and there's some purpose to me being and, here, and uh, all that. And on the flip side, I thought it was interesting with Roshek, how he'd started off very much as you'd expect from his, you know, I thought you did a very lawful evil very well. You weren't like, aha, I'm going to murder everyone. You were just a bit yeah. selfish, a bit egotistical a bit this is how i do things i don't really care about others and i thought that's fine that's an interesting character yeah. rather than a cackling evil genius but i felt as the uh, eventual went on more and more yeah. he kind of every now and then wouldn't be selfish it was very and it almost yes. felt like you were confused when you were like you'd like i yes. suddenly care about this person what what's going on what yeah what <laughs> yes Mm. Yes, exactly, because, mm. uh, and I didn't, I'm glad that you say that, actually, it's because it's, it's fun to reflect over a bit. I I didn't, uh, I tried, I think, out of character to sort of stick to 
to the, 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 the lawful evil bits, you know. It's like, oh, he is this. This defines him. This is how he should be. But at the same time, you know, then you're in it when you're in character. It's like, well, what do I, what do I do? Uh, and you you don't have time to think too much about what would be right for the character because you're you're just supposed to play the character, really. Uh, and uh, it's like because he got this funny trait that he's going, he's he should fight for those who can't fight for themselves. And how do you make that? How do you still make that sort of evil or selfish? And but I th I think maybe it, it this is like his first time outside of a outside of a, a, a who say what should you say evil context perhaps I mean this is the first time he's outside out of a, band, a mercenary group band and out yeah. of the orc tribe that normally aren't pleasant yeah yeah so I uh, and he's young and he. It got affected by uh, uh, all of these things. I thought it was very interesting as well. Um, again, maybe it didn't always come across, but I was trying to make a few points about fate because it's a big part of the adventure is fate and what is ordained and how your characters went different routes on that. I felt with Roshek, it was the route of being told something and you believed it and you went for it. He never really questioned it. And yes. Roman was more... No one was really telling him what to do but he kind of made assumptions. He assumed things, and then he made his own destiny and fate. Even though he, for example, was never really told, like he was never told, uh, you have been sent by Lefanda. I've totally been sent by Lefanda. This is my divine mission. And then Roshik yeah. on the other hand was being told constantly, you are the chosen one. This is your destiny. And being like, okay, okay, cool. What do you guys think of that? Yes, exactly. And and but he was... Roman was just continually tortured by dreams and, and memories and stuff, and it's more like a feeling of everything he did was wrong. Yeah, for sure. I mean, nothing nothing went as he had planned, and he sort of just got to this point where he couldn't keep living with that without explaining it somehow, without explaining mm. that it is part of a greater plan. It is uh, the collateral damage that I am causing here. It is... It's okay because I'm on a holy mission from the Thunder, and and uh, he wills it thus. Uh, then I don't have to think about it. I can be a soldier. I can be a servant. And um, I mean, you know, it's not like he did any like. How can I say? It wasn't like really consciously evil things. It was more just the result of actions and, and the result of inaction and the result of yeah, not trying to save everybody really just sometimes mm. just being really pragmatic and realist and being like no I, I, it's not gonna work here so i'm not even gonna try i'm just gonna go i'm just gonna go somewhere else and again that's why i thought your when well, we will talk more about that in a minute but his end i thought reflected that wonderfully because obviously as a human that's a great thing but in the world of gods of alignments i was like well you realize mm. as far as your god's concerned it's not black and white at all it's completely you should have done this and that yes you mm -hmm. know uh, yeah, it, yeah it, is, it is black and white for sure it's uh, mm -hmm. it's not not as gray as as ravenloft can uh, i suppose easily easily become um, yes. so yeah that was really interesting so what do you think uh about this matthias what do you think for roman was it a relief to be able to make his own decision or was it more torment hmm whereas the if, if you don't, like craig described it like normally you would always hear your god and you have an active what was it uh yeah was it a, a lure perhaps that, that he was able to sort of do things and get away with it and make his own decisions and of things or was it i think in a way he he kind of became i mean he almost became happier in ravenloft because in, in the beginning he is very much not happy at all he's drinking to i i, I don't know mm. if it works that way in in the world but i, I sort of yeah. use this drinking as a way of this is how I disconnect from my God because I don't want my God to hear what I'm thinking. I don't want mm. my God to see who I really am because who I am is not what I'm supposed to be. Right. Um, and then he comes into uh, the Dread Realms, into Ravenloft, and here he no longer he no longer has that connection, which at first, of course, causes him to be panicked because that means there's no guidance, right? But yeah. then he starts to realize that in a way, this allows him to to be who he is and to embrace it. In a way, he's still 
he's still of course looking for that connection but but i don't know yeah he 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 is conflicted but i i felt towards the end there he becomes very much yeah he is sort of enjoying it in a way in a weird yeah, way yeah yeah i suppose i'll conclude on thinking how do we think they were different from Carver and Bjorn? Because there was definitely a difference, but I've been thinking about it. I'm not sure what it is. Like, what, what do you think? Because it was, again, a similar sort of two guys doing things, but there was a big difference. I felt, but I'm not quite sure what it was. Yeah. One huge difference for me was to play a character that hadn't experienced uh, love as much in the same way. Yes. Uh, mm. Where uh, uh, Bjorn, he he yeah he had been in love and he had been, uh, he'd been he'd been sort of I don't know tormented in, in a completely different way where we had to make all these uh, choices and leading him away from love that he would have wanted to have. I mean, Rushik, of course, he would have the the family and the tribe and stuff like that, but it's a different thing. It's uh it's uh. I don't know. He, he he's younger. He's brasher. He he uh, he wants to do a lot more. He he's like, yeah. I don't know. Yeah, I, 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 maybe you could see some some parallels with a young Bjorn. I don't know, like the one hmm. fighting for uh, the KGB. But no, again, that then then he had a purpose and he had clear orders uh, that he followed as well. Uh, I don't know if you could compare that to sort of the orders of the clan and then sort of trying to stand up to them. I mean, I felt, the thing I want to say is I felt Bjorn and Carver were two different people initially, but towards the end, they did kind of align a lot more. Like, they both had a similar ideal uh, Uh. of what they wanted to do. They both thought, like uh, we said, Bjorn felt there was a future, Carver didn't towards the end but they both felt that what they were doing was right and they wanted to do it i feel in your case the goal was orientated but you never kind of you were always different and even in the end you acknowledged that the two characters were different it's like we may you know we are different people hell yeah. even i'm gonna go home you're gonna stay here which again was a we'll talk more about that in a minute but i thought that was a great uh, i didn't expect that actually i didn't expect there would be a parting of ways in that way anyway so that was interesting yeah, hmm. uh, for the longest time, yeah. I, I mean, Roshik had trouble relating to Roman. He he couldn't he couldn't really relate to him. He had uh, he he thought he was very strange to him to to continually care so much about this entity that isn't even responding to him, uh, but still. Uh, apparently wielding a, a great power that must come through the entity and making his mind up and then saying that it must be for the will of of Lathander and he he, he was just very convinced that what he was doing was right for for a specific purpose not for himself mm. but for something else and I, I, for a long time, was wondering what kind of conflict might spring from it and what might happen in the end. And uh, at times I thought that Roshik would turn on Roman and either, like, try to sort of con- take control of, of this land for himself or, or and sort of expel Roman from there. Uh, and I was very conflicted myself, like, where do I want to take this? Do, does... Where did, what does what does Rushik want really? Does he want to rule these lands instead? Does he want to uh, make things better for everyone here? And does he care at all about this mm. really, or is it just in for the whole whole challenge? And I kind of wanted to steer it towards him, like yeah, he can he can be the lord of the land instead. But somehow, whenever he was faced with choices that could lead that way. It just didn't, just didn't fit somehow. It was something that didn't click. Mm. And maybe that's a good way of segueing into the next question, which we maybe already discussed a bit, but we can conclude, is now let's talk a bit about the journey the characters went through. Matthias, so, I mean, we already kind of said, but yeah, if you were to summarise, 
how did the entire journey affect Roman? And same for you as well, Hiamar, but we'll start with you, Matthias. Mm. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, in, in the beginning, he comes in with... Um, with a lot of doubts and a lot of uh, you know a lot of memories that are that are torturing him, and he's trying to hide um, who who he is in a way, um, and then he comes to this land and the, the connection is gone and he is now all by himself, and he's forced to make difficult decisions that all of them basically turn out wrong in some way um even if he he might go into them with a, sort of a good heart and good intentions um they all end up you know radically shifting the balance of power or um, as in the case mm. with the the abbey where we end up you know killing what is from a an alignment perspective i suppose a very lawful good character right i mean it's a uh holy uh diva or something like that one of those Mm. Uh, very very good celestial uh, you know, celestial beings right mm. uh, yes. an angel essentially mm. um so dealing with that dealing with a, a world where things are very complex and there's all these bad consequences it it, it does start to change him and, and as we say i mean the, it, towards the end there he just he just has to find some way of justifying it and and that changes who who he is, but but when he then comes out of it at the other side, I mean he he has through that found a purpose. He has confessed who he is, uh, and that's what he does there at the scene with uh, with his uh, with his son, of course, with uh, with basically confessing that it is he is he is weak and uh, he is okay with that. And when the consequences of that comes with uh, with Lathander, with uh, the, the the scenes at the end there, he he is relieved. I think he is very relieved about about that, and thus begins this this really tough journey that he he's he's on then to try to somehow regain this trust. But but I think he's genuinely happy and and hopeful uh, about that. It's almost as if he acknowledging that he is weak and not as good as he thought he was. He's, yeah, happier because, especially because his God literally tells him, you aren't worthy, you've messed up, here's what you have to do to maybe be forgiven. And then he's like, oh, brilliant. Again, that it's almost like he takes a step back to how he was at the start, where it's like, brilliant, I'm being told what to do again. This is good. This time I'll be better. That sort of mm, thing. This, and this time I will not go into it with a lie. I will be, I will be who I am. And I, I, I will accept myself for who I am with you know, mm-hmm. warts and all, weaknesses and all. And uh, I don't have to be this pristine paladin of light. You know, I can be, I can be the priest Roman, uh, a human, a man. Yes. Not God sent. No. Mm. But doing your best. Yes. Hmm. What do you think was the turning point for him then? I mean... When did he, when did he start forgiving himself? I think that that really comes. The the forgiveness part really comes at the end. I think. Yeah. Um, it comes in in the seeing his son there, and and confessing finally to himself. That. Yeah. I mean, that, do you, you know, think he, there was also yeah. maybe a step to that? Was the uh, door scene yeah what about that one you mean with the uh <clears throat> with the, the mirrors, mirrors and stuff yes yes mm-hmm. speak to your son to death yeah <laughs> yeah that certainly affected him uh affected him as well i suppose at that point he was sort of convinced that whatever he saw was some kind of e- illusion i mean mm. you know because there's another scene in which there's a dream sequence where he he starts beating all these you know uh, uh, this lynch mob that's coming to kill uh, what he sees as his son, um, yeah. and and he and here he actually fights. He fights a fight that he would lose and he would die, and he dares to do that yeah. because he knows that it's not real. Um, and there he does does not have to. I mean, he is not. He he knows that it's not real, so he has courage. He is he is his ideal rather than who he actually is. So mm. in the end scene, mm. then where you say no, but this is real, and you know that this is real now. This is not an illusion. This is actually your son that you see uh, in front of you. 
then he has to mm. deal with that. And that is when sort of the catharsis finally comes and he finally makes uh, makes that confession to himself um, about about who he is and about about his about his weaknesses. And that's I think when things really change for him. Right. So the times like before when he was challenged, because there were some times that he was challenged like by visions of his son, but he was still sort of, <clears throat> he, sorry, he was sort of, uh, he seemed pretty sure that, no, this is not real. I, uh, I do not owe anything to this image that I see of my son. I don't remember exactly, but I think you mm. I, I had dreams about him mm -hmm. as well. Uh, yeah, yeah, there were dreams and there were plenty of visions along the road. I mean, there was a lot of meetings right. with the the son, basically. But yeah, but I I justified it as um, Roman would know that this is not real because it yeah. does not make any logical sense that it is uh, that it is yeah. real. Uh, this mm -hmm. is this mm -hmm. is obviously some power that's that's trying to to torture me. And perhaps some of it was real, but he at least chose not to believe it. Um, yeah. But then finally at the end there comes that no this is now you know that this is real and now you have to deal with it so what do you do and yeah that's when a decision finally comes and i'll say that yes. that's not something i'd planned uh, that that's something no. that came to me in that moment um of of course yes which that is, is awesome um and yes and yes was he real was he not real maybe i won't mm. answer that but i'll definitely say that at times you are right to assume it was a uh based on the logic of Feyrun, at least it shouldn't have been possible but perhaps I played around with the idea, viewers, that uh, if you bring things in with you, maybe that changes the rules. So, for example, maybe if the son had died a peaceful death and you, Roman, were 150% fine with that, maybe that wouldn't have been as effective or even being able to use. But the fact that it wasn't resolved. Same with Roshek. Things that aren't resolved. Things that you still dwell on. Maybe yeah. in this realm they can come back in one form or the other. Maybe. Yeah. Or not. Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And there were plenty I of things that came uh, back for Russia. Yeah. Huh? A lot of mm. uh, family affairs of various kinds. Yes, yes let's, let's move to Roshek. And yeah, the same question of, yeah, what was Roshek's journey? <laughs> um, well, he started off like very much sort of wanting to have some sort of purpose, just like uh, Roman, I suppose. Uh, from, I don't know, what, what, what is it? I, I, and I think he sort of just wanted to grab on to anything that he could find, and, and he was very susceptible to these voices that he heard. And uh, when, once he got his head around, yeah, okay, we're on this mission, mission to defeat the devil uh, not as much you know free the lands but just defeat the devil that then that sort of gradually grew onto him and at the end I think he uh, he I mean he went from wanting to believe it to really believing it strongly much through these voices which made the end really hard for him in, in realizing that the voices might have come sort of from the devil himself or at least that's what he uh, interpreted it as mm, not to mention I'm editing in today's very episode the very first time someone used a scrying spell on you which was used many times and you never clocked I was always thinking when's he gonna click that maybe every time I asked you do you allow this to happen or do you resist and you went I allow it like, okay yes okay Yes. Because yes. Hey, no, he had no idea. It's uh, it's not magic that he's familiar with. Mm. Uh, Rudolf told him that he was very suspicious about it, but then again, he was suspicious about everything. Um, Roman wasn't completely closed to whatever Roshik said about his dreams and stuff like that. So I, I, I don't think there was a way for him to figure it out on his own mm. that... Who, who who could, because it was just tied together with the Vistani and his inherent guilt that he felt from that first encounter that was taking place before the adventure of how he had killed two Vistani that were defenseless and he felt horrible about that. Mm -hmm. And so he 
knew that she muttered some sort of curse, but she, he doesn't didn't know for sure if, if that was actually something that attached to him or if it was just in his head. And then Madame Eva confirmed it and said that she removed it. And from that moment on, he just continually got this positive, positive reinforcement. And uh, that's, I suppose, what, what it came to be, something very positive for him. A, a, a big source of, uh, uh, what do you call it, encouragement, really. It's like, if, of course he would want to let that in, because compared to everything he's tried to do before in his life, it, it, it suddenly had a purpose. Mm. It suddenly, he was meant to do something, and it probably was something great, because here is someone, you know, that holds reign over such a big land. <laughs> And yet I find it interesting that at the very end, you resisted after the whole time of going along with everything. It was just at that last moment you finally did go, wait, what? Yes. Hmm. Because then that one thing suddenly went again, all of the rest of it. It's like everything had been this slow-feeding sort of mechanism and I think also the encounter with his father's mirror image you know when he suddenly he was told to let go of this medallion that he had picked up and he was left very confused with that it's like what what, what did the medallion mean what what did the encounters with his father mean were they illusions or because they suddenly everything doesn't point in the same direction anymore. And everything seems to have point in the, pointed in the direction towards slaying the devil. But the moment he goes to attack the devil, he gets a strong indication of something else. You know, if it, if it, uh, if it had been woven in earlier through these scrying things or whatever, in a way that, you know, they start saying like, things like, you're doing very well, but there is something about the priest that you shouldn't trust. Mm. The priest has, the, oh, you know, start weaving in, you know, that maybe there's something with the priest. But instead, he was always fed these things that like he has to go for these artifacts in order to defeat the devil. The ultimate goal is still defeating the devil. There was no other sort of sidetrack of what he shouldn't trust and who he might want to kill. Mm. You know. I think as well, it's interesting you say that because, again, this is a classic case of the role play led the direction because that final moment, Roshek didn't ask questions. He wasn't talking. He went, I'm ready, let's do it. So mm. maybe the reaction to that came across as clumsy because the individual in question was doing something clumsily. Because, you know, exactly. no one's perfect, are they? So again, like if nothing was said then, you were about to charge straight head forward. And then it would make no sense mid-battle to suddenly get given a message like that. So... Again, it's yeah. all very... It's very indicative of your two... Uh, my opinion of your journey was I loved how dedicated you were to moving forwards. Uh, yes. You never... Very rarely questioned things. You very rarely, <laughs> when you were told to do something, didn't do it, actually. Like, if an NPC said, this is important, you went, yes, it is. You, you did like, because in some adventures, people are totally like, wait, why is this guy telling us to do this? Is this some ulterior motive? Maybe we should... Like, you were like, nope, nope, Van Richten says, leave town soon as. Well, we should leave town soon as. <laughs> I know. It's like, oh, that conflict there, that was so hard as a player as well, I found. Uh, because, you know, it's so funny. Because we just met Van Richten. I mean, he just revealed mm. himself to us, and we were very suspicious about him. But then, all of a sudden... We decide, no, he is the one to trust. Everything else is fake. Uh, let's go. Mm. Let's get out of here. And it's, I don't know. For me, it's kind of tied together with the the mayor being so heavily criticized by everyone uh, and everyone being miserable. It's like, OK, I think the, the tipping point came there when Van Richten said that you should get out of here. And that also that Irina wouldn't be safe here anyway, so she'd be safe just going with us somewhere. Oh, and that's the thing. It's totally legitimate. And also, again, it represents how you played your characters. 
you weren't mm. investigators. You weren't, uh, yeah. especially Roman, more and more was less concerned about doing right for doing right and more doing mm. his mission. And your mission, well, for Roshek, it was never help people out. And for Roman, he, again, I loved the whole, the final things you said, like casualties of war. Sometimes there are casualties. We, we can't be worrying about them. And I was like, brilliant. What a great character you've become from... Like, we have to help, you know, because, again, you could have been completely different. You could have been, like you said, like one point we said, if you were a rogue, you would have totally been like, oh, I want to find out what's in that building. Yeah. I want to break into that lock, you know, that sort of thing. And, yeah. again, like, um, if Roman had been a different sort of priest or even a different sort of good character, wait, let's find out about those kids. Let's, I mean, another good example was the church where yeah. I love Roshek's like, so you can tell there's something up with this priest. What do you do? I go up to the priest and tell him, listen, priest, you get in our way. You do anything. And so help me. And the priest responded with, Oh, fuck, okay. I'm sorry. You can go. <laughs> and then and then Roman literally just walks in and walks out. Like, I'm sure everything's fine here. <laughs> it's so clumsy. Oh, they're like... It's like these uh, grunt, these foot soldiers, you know. They're just justifying everything and uh, with their own laws. Mm. Oh. Yeah. And again, and like they, yeah, said, I'll just say there's not they're not inquisitive at all. They're like they're they're not curious as to how things work and and why. But it's like except no, except yeah. when Roshek would ask Roman time and time again. So wait, how does that spell work, Roman? How does this work <laughs> with your God, Roman? And Roman would go, maybe one day I'll explain. Maybe one day, <laughs> one day. Yeah, I'll explain. it never happened. <laughs> Never is there a lot of that? Is there a lot of that? That's a few, yes, there's there a few is. cases of it. Hmm. I Especially think in the, the editing, start, you probably at least three it. times yeah. in the editing, I've gone just laugh because it's like, so wait, Roman, how did you like? Does the axe move? Do you control it with your mind? Everyone's like, oh yeah, I'll explain one day, Roshek, one day. <laughs> <laughs> but it's not today. It's exactly. Is it? Is it your God moving it for you? Mm. Is it? Yeah, I don't remember that. Yeah, uh, because I think yeah, he was very curious about that because. I don't know. I mean, magic is common, right? I mean, even in a band of bandits, there they might it's be... It's interesting. A, a it's magician. common, but it's not common who uses it. So, for example, it's not like... There's a reason there are still villages full of villagers. They can't use magic. Yeah. But a local wizard would be known. That sort of thing. It's sort of like, well, there is a wizard yeah. in the village, but he's still... Ooh, it's a bit mysterious. And then in the big cities, there's obviously like the conclaves of mages and magical organizations but it's still something that it's supposed to be implied that not everyone's a wizard that's why your character is a wizard it's supposed to be, you know that's why your character is the whole point of D&D 5th edition is your characters are supposed to stand out a little so your it's fighter is a bit better mm. than normal fighters that sort of thing mm. yeah they're not a town guard it's you know mm. yeah, sorry. it's an interesting analysis I think uh when you think about that, why he was so curious about Roman, but maybe it's like, uh, yeah, things he needed to know in order to trust him, perhaps, if he's going to work with him. Mm. Mm. Yeah, um, and, I, and I think it's also, I mean, the uh, the lack of uh, maybe sort of digging very deep into it, I think, is, I mean, Roman, as a priest, he wanted to be seen as decisive and as sort of being able to feel what was the, the, the right thing to do. Um, mm. that's sort of how he should uh, how he should normally act like no, always yeah. knowing what to do he wanted to not like he was filled with doubt but he didn't want to show that doubt necessarily uh, outward uh, he did it at a few times but but I think in general he tried to sort of always seem like he knew what what to do um, so that yeah. may be one reason I think why uh, there wasn't so many so many questions. Another one is, I think, probably also because, you know, what we're doing, we're doing a podcast and um, mm. wanting to really keep things moving forward always, uh, really trying to sort of mainline the story in a way that you still sort of cover it, but you don't get bogged down in, 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 in long uh, conversations or, uh, you know, things like that. That yeah. uh, I, I feel I'd... like in, in a way, you know, you, we had sort of gotten the information that we needed from the conversation. So if I was like, OK, yeah, now we know this. I ha I've had a bad feeling about the Baron. Okay, cool. Let's go. Let's just get out of here. It makes sense. Um, and and sort of letting that that feeling and, and that emotion sort of guide both me and my character, which I feel makes sense because there's no God that's telling him what to do. So he just goes with with his gut. Exactly. And I definitely feel as well if we encompass the whole thing, 
even that directness changed. So it's not like you were the same direct the whole journey. I feel you started off unsure. Then you were direct, but you were never quite sure why you were being direct. You were kind of going with the flow. Mm. Be- and then at the end, I feel you felt at least you were in control. Towards the end, you felt, no, we're not being led around anymore. We are doing this because we want to, and now we're going to do it no matter what. I feel that was the big core difference. Like in the first half, you were doing um, being direct because you didn't think you had a choice. And then in the end, you were being direct because it was your choice, if that makes sense. Mm. Yeah, definitely. Mm. I think you're right mm. about that. Mm. So perhaps that leads straight into talking about the actual adventure itself. What did we think about the setup and the mission you were on? So what did we think of the, uh, as you now are probably quite aware, as everyone who runs the adventure would be, the element of this mission is very much uh, you go in, you get given your checklist, which can be completely different each time, and you go and get your things to then achieve your final goal. That is the sort of setup, if you will. And we did that. What did you think? I think it's really a sort of straightforward setup there. And I think it did feel like, like, I mean, Roman had a reason for doing it. Roman wanted to get out of there. It's a natural thing to want to get out of this very dreary place. I mean, he didn't necessarily have something glorious waiting for him back home, but I, I felt like I could justify why he would do this. There was obviously no way out of this, like no normal way out of it. Everyone just kept telling us that, look, you're not going to be able to get out. So obviously something big had to be done and we found out that that big thing was to somehow be the one to defeat the devil and my character could buy into that and then these these hoops that had to be jumped through like getting becoming more powerful it made all the sense in the world because when we did meet the count when we did meet his his followers we were sort of woefully unprepared for it i mean the first vampire we met we I mean, it could have gone really, really badly uh, had he not mm. just tried to run away from us because he was obviously very, very powerful. Um, and yeah, it it uh, it felt logical what we were doing, I think. And I mean, we didn't really have... In the Black Madonna, there's a curse, right? So you like, okay, you do this or you're dead. Here, you're in this realm. Do you want to spend the rest of your days in this realm? Probably not. Uh, I mean, maybe you do if you want to become king of it or something like that, but... But Roman certainly had a reason to want to get out. And I think then the cooperation aspect of why would he do this together with Roshek, who is, you know, again, they're not necessarily going to see eye to eye on, like, moral issues. But but it made sense because they were both in the same situation. They And they were sort of... They were the only... Like, they, they somehow knew each other, even if it's just a little bit. They, it was some kind of... Something familiar from home in this strange place. So it made sense to stick together because w- what else are you going to do? You know, you, you don't want to go at it alone. Um, so I think, yeah, the, the adventure itself is, uh, is, is quite, yeah, it's a good, it's a good setup. And, and I think what I enjoy a lot with it, even though we didn't really move so much in that direction is just how much is available to do if you want to do it. I mean, I really got this, positive feeling uh, and a sort of rem- reminder of a computer role-playing game where you have all these side quests and sub things around that yeah you can go there if you want it's there um you know the road is right there do you want to go uh, and then we decided most often like pretty much always to no no we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna do the main thing we have a we have something we're supposed to do here. we're gonna do that but to feel like that was a choice we chose to do that we could have go- done this other thing and it would have been uh, a relevant choice to do and Craig probably had great material prepared but we chose to go this other way that there was this feeling of of having a choice of being in control and that there are things that we're not seeing now but that's a that's a decision that we're making and that felt mm. great you know it, it didn't feel like it was some like railroad that we just were riding on and just seeing exactly what you wanted to show us it was it was a something where we were in control and we we sometimes very heavily deviated from the course i mean like not seeing the wedding for example mm-hmm. um and 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 i mean I, i'm sure we could have gone into some of these temples we could have followed some of these other paths we could have gone and seen what was going on with the the the, the lights in the uh, in the mm. lake in the middle of the night um and and like well we did that we figured that one out we did it we, towards the end there yeah but uh but we we skipped sort of uh initially so it um yeah just the feeling of 
our choices being it's okay that we don't we don't see these mm. things and we still yes. kept yeah. living. it felt and alive really, and real you know i'm glad you feel that way because i did try i mean i'll be honest there were times where like you said maybe some stuff was prepared and then i had to prepare some other stuff maybe a bit on the fly initially i was worried not because it was a bad thing but i was just worried it wouldn't it would feel different i was worried you'd be like oh this clearly feels like something put together in five seconds uh but i don't think it did and also sometimes some mm. really fun things happen for example uh meeting strada on the road was the direct result of you going off the path completely that wasn't supposed to yeah. happen that wasn't supposed to be your first meeting with him at all i guess very quickly threw it together and i feel it ended up feeling quite effective even <laughs> hell a horse died <laughs> completely so, based yes, on exactly yeah, yeah. was he the supposed to show horse. up at the festival or yes yes he was hmm. he was going to show up at the festival make a big public spectacle of it and many things were going to happen there were many things you could have done to interact with that Falakai was definitely I'm sure you felt the biggest part of the game where there was lots of stuff you didn't do but could have but it didn't matter yeah. And then a lot of the final sessions were also direct responses to things you hadn't done coming forward in a yeah. different way. For example, the Vistani in the tavern. I came up with that yeah. two or three sessions before we did it. And that was perfectly, that was because you could totally have met both those guys and killed them ages ago. That whole thing couldn't have happened. But the way things went, that came out. And I liked that scene. I, I thought that was a fun one, the... Uh, the Stani and the tavern and the burning of it down. I thought that was brilliant. That was a perfect example of like, here's what happens, guys. Yeah. You lose your hate. But those guys there that, that, that were supposed to be sort of brothers to the one that I killed, did, did they uh, originally play another role then? Oh, yes. Well, for example, I'll tell you now, the daughter or the kid, the kid got killed. You could totally have stopped that happening. You saw the, the aftermath. Daughter? Remember when you went and they found the fisherman and they were going to kill him? You could have... Right, yeah. In time period-wise, you would have gone earlier. You could have stopped that. You would have seen the the guy being oh, out on the boat from with the dying. lights was him about to dump the child into the river. Ah. <laughs> mm. We didn't accept, Nice. We didn't accept, I, 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 thought, I, I thought you just... Okay, so let's give another go at this and see if they do it this time instead no, no, but then I, that was actually time wise oh yeah no, I, no I didn't do that I literally went with that's the consequence the kid's dead you can't right. save that kid now but maybe you can see the aftermath of the kid being killed <laughs> Bless. so let's kill everyone hmm. and and then find out that the one they wanted to kill was actually someone that had to die and so we kill him too hmm. <laughs> hmm. Uh, oh it's a very typical brilliant. Roman and Rorschach situation. Uh, but yeah, so yeah, Yalmar, what do you, yeah, let's move it to you. What did you think then in terms of the actual mission, what you had to do, that sort of thing? Uh, I, I think it started uh, in a fun way and, and um, it was fun to just get thrown into the adventure like we did. Um, but I think I've said most of my things uh, of how uh, Rorschach, uh, it became a long journey of him trying to relate to Roman but it, uh, honestly, it's probably mostly just relating to this search for a purpose and these voices that he kept her hearing and he, he wanted it so so badly. He liked the straightforwardness mm. of just getting this sort of uh, quest. Mm. That, that, that's that, that, that's yeah, the kind of thing he would like. Yeah, he, he likes it. He likes it. Yeah. S straight. Forward. I'll add on to this one then um, to then go into this next question as well is we didn't go to a few places but what did we think of the places we did go as encounters as general this is coming out of character as well like what did we feel what did we feel about Valakai Kresek but the village of Barovia uh, Argon Vostholt Castle Ravenloft what, what are our, any thoughts or feelings favourite moments that sort of thing I really loved Argon Vostholt I thought that that was, I mean, like, because there was one session mm. there where uh, we sort of st we stopped right before the fight with the um, the main guy there, 
and uh, yeah and i remember like i was so excited about that fight i really wanted to like think of strategies mm. of like how we we're gonna yeah. take him down it was yes, yes i remember yes. i was even talking to uh to yamar who would have none of it he would, did not want to prefer anything <laughs> so i had to do it but by myself a character. <laughs> it's like <laughs> yes how we go. you were like ah oh, i can send a message to her and <laughs> then we do this and I'm like no i don't want to talk. <laughs> yeah because it was because it, no 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 because it was um i was just so excited about that place because it was it, yeah. it really felt like uh, such a place steeped with history and there were so many um, characters in there that had you know agendas and there was something important that we had to find there yet we were sort of yeah. outmatched and outgunned completely um, and I really yeah I really liked that place and I really liked that we got to come back to it and then bring some form of uh, yeah. well not peace obviously because no one gets any peace in, in the Dread Realms but uh, you know we got to bring the light back okay. in, in a way which was really uh, really quite quite cool i agree i'm they, in a way on the checklist of things we didn't do the one thing you did do was at least do a good thing there like you didn't do anywhere else for the most part but that was one of the few because for a moment i was thinking oh god they're gonna just kill the guy because obviously um you ended up not winning that encounter but that was again just mm. because of dice if you'd rolled better you could have, if there'd be more players, you could have. It's totally, it's not like there was some plot armor there, like he's invincible. Yeah. He's not. He can be killed. You can get the sword then. I was then going to have to change a hell of a lot because I had the whole, uh, the whole point. <laughs> you had to go and do stuff so they come and get it. And I was like, well, if they have it now, shit, let's just change things. Um, yeah. Which I was prepared for. I was ready. I was like, you know what? We're going to do it. If they win the sword, they've earned it. Let's do this. Yeah. But the funny thing was you were going to have revenants after you. And that was going to be yeah. hilarious because you would have killed him. He comes back because they're revenants, and then they would have, you would have become one of their enemies. And revenants hunt down their enemies night and day mercilessly until they kill you. So you were going to have, I was going to like, brilliant. They're going to have every kind of like day. There's going to be like you see them on the hill, or they're coming on horseback. You're like, how oh, the fuck? Yeah. Leave us alone. We're, we're revenants. We, we don't leave people exactly. alone. Exactly. That's our thing. <laughs> like yeah. ring wraiths. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Instead, yeah, yeah. you helped them. <laughs> yeah, we did. End I up like doing that it. character too. The the moody, long haired mm -hmm. guardian there. Uh, I, I mean, we're going to talk a little bit about NPCs later, but yeah, I, I agree with Matthias. The Argenvast Holt uh, place, yeah, it's, it was it was lovely. I'm really glad mm. about that because that's one of the harder ones to. I'm sure some viewers will agree. If you run it by the book, the pacing can be a bit difficult because by book, it's actually a mansion with like five. 10 rooms per floor that sort of thing and there's random mm. ghost encounters it's like you go into this chamber there's some ghosts you go to that one there's some ghosts have a fight it's like uh. so i cut mm. that out because i wanted it to be more streamlined to narrative rather than because basically yeah oh. like things like those revenants who led you up mm. they wouldn't normally do that they normally just attack you like die and you mm -hmm. fight big fight and <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Mm. But, but those are the customizations that have to be made with sort of your typical, I think, Dungeons and Dragons adventure is, is to make them sort of flow without the constant sort of interruption of combat because combat is, especially in a podcast, especially where you don't have any visual support, it is not really that interesting to listen to for long mm. stretches of time. I think if it is an impactful combat, it's... You know, it's an important one, and maybe you haven't had one for a while, then you can go with it. But if it's just combat, combat, combat all the time, it's just, I don't know. I personally find mm. it difficult to, to uh, yes. so stay with that. It, I zoom out, you know. So um, And it's funny I think because, it, again, you when well. you went to the ceiling, for example, which, again, was that thing you did again. Like I was like, really? They're going to, oh, okay, they're actually going to the ceiling and investigating the tower. Uh, that's supposed to have oh you totally get ambushed by 10 ghosts and there's two in each tower and they snipe you and try and flank you yeah. and a great tactical battle if that's what you want but you mm -hmm. were doing it at the end of a session and i was like i don't want to have you get attacked by ghosts <laughs> <laughs> i think uh it was it just added a lot more to the sort of menacing atmosphere when we sort of, you know, we knew that all these guardians and the ghosts were there because we saw the ghosts coming in and out through the wall, uh, but we didn't know how, uh, what kind of foe they would be, would, how powerful they would be to fight. But you knew they were there, and that kind of just 
made if you like if you if you if you had had a fight with the guardians you won that and then fi fought some ghosts you automatically get a like you get an idea of okay how hard are these to defeat uh but if you don't mm. know it it just adds a lot of tension like uh, uh what what dare we do in this place mm. i did like the spider fight though <laughs> mm. i like that was, that was absolutely. just a fun little let's just fight some spiders come on just once because they're there. Because yeah. I, I remember, like, reacting to it first. I was like, Craig, really? It's spiders? <laughs> We're going to find spiders here? But then we did. And then that turned out quite interesting, actually, with Roman becoming all panicked. Because <laughs> because all of a sudden, the spiders seemed really tough. <laughs> and I was like, shit, I have to yeah. call for Irene. Otherwise, her, or uh, was it Esmeralda? Esmeralda, yeah. I have to call for Esmeralda. Esmeralda yeah. Because, yeah. Because we're, we're doomed. <laughs> and uh, so it, it turned out How really interesting, you? which was uh, unexpected. Yeah. How did you... So you you didn't originally like the idea of of uh, us going to fight some uh, spiders. I mean, it's it's just more like it, it, I don't know. I get I guess I sort of see what we do as being sort of you know epic and impactful. And like spiders are, <laughs> are like right next to rats in my in my yes. book of, of enemies. But and I'm that's glad why I'm you also. Uh, that's that's also where the rug comes into the picture later on in the castle. I'm like, <laughs> really, crack you? That was fight a rug. It, maybe but it has to do with my smothering. arachnophobia then. Yeah, I, know. Like, I like that you then trusted me that, for example, that was a fun fight. It was fun because it wasn't that yeah. difficult. But like I said, Roman failing, getting to that point where he was repanning, and then Roshik just sort of like, come on. And it's like, oh, oh yeah, great. We did it. We killed them. Oh, that's, we're fine. I guess a bit of poison. Um, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Then, and it all turned out really well. And the important thing being that I didn't, because then, obviously, you could go, no, there's more spiders, more spiders. Like, no, that's enough. You had a spider fight in a little <laughs> spider den. That's basically the whole, that whole room is the spider den. And let's move on. Yeah. And then they didn't encounter spiders again. It, 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 it made it feel like a set piece as opposed to just a random encounter with some spiders. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I think that's the, the the important thing is that you did something with it because at first I was like, oh shit, did he like roll on a random encounter table and <laughs> end up with some spiders or an attacking rug? No, no, okay. Okay, there was an idea with this and, and um, it ended up working. Like the, the rug, for example, later on in, in the adventure was, I mean, it made the whole castle seem so weird and like anything could attack you all of a sudden, you know? Mm. So you were yeah. you kind of became cautious in a different way. And it was sort of wonderfully weird also. Uh, just You're like lucky this. because I also made a mistake. Um, the portrait was supposed to tag you as well. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, did, I read it afterwards. I was like, and then when the rugs attacked, the, uh, oh, I thought the portrait was its own separate thing. Uh, it turns out, no, it would have both things were supposed to attack you. So uh, you would have had a port painting. <laughs> what does the painting do? <laughs> it flies around. It can cast spells. And when it casts spells, the picture of Strahd in the picture actually moves like it's casting the spell. So you see it forming a fireball and then it comes out of the painting. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I mean, that, I suppose those fireballs can be quite fearful, but it just feels so funny with a, yeah, no, it's, it's a portrait flying around. It feels like lo like very much like Dungeons and Dragons, kind of like how I, I thought about it before, I think, and how how it, it, it can and maybe should be in a way, which is this, like, yeah, you end up with in the, all these like weird kind of cool fights um, yeah. against unexpected foes. So The sad thing about the poor rug of smothering is also you activated it in the safest way possible. It's supposed hmm. to, you step on it. When you step mm. on it, it immediately tries to smother you. But of course, in your case, as you sort of just poked it, it came to life and then tried to smother you and failed. It was a bit like, yeah, because... And then you obviously took out because the whole it's more a trap as opposed to a foe. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. I, I, I thought I was going to look under it, you know, just lift it up and, uh, and see what's under it to see if mm. there's any sort of trap mechanism. Mm. I didn't expect the actual rug to come mm. flying at me. <laughs> yeah. Which That's is great. Cool. And... And then uh, other places, I mean, I, obviously the Valakai was, I mean, the Baron is uh, really, he's, because I, I couldn't at first make up my mind if he was kind of good, because he seemed like he was kind of protecting this place. It was a lot better mm. off than Barovia was. So at first I remember Roman was like, yeah, okay, well, you know, my, maybe I can close my eyes on some of this, uh, you know, torturing of the people in the streets, but, you know, it seems like everyone's safe here at least. So, yeah, yeah that's something. And then I think it was like yeah. Irene at that point was like, no, 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 come on, <laughs> look at all these people in the, uh, in the stock, like the, these uh, stocks that were uh, out on the, out on the street there, you know. Yeah. Like, oh, okay. Mm. 
And then we met him, and, and he, he was kind of nice, actually. At first, I, I remember thinking that, yeah, yeah I kind of like this guy. I mean, he's obviously, he's done some eccentric. shit. I mean, you know, eccentric, mm. definitely that as well. Um, but it felt good. But then it was just, it was at that point where it was like, no, you guys aren't going to leave. It's like, okay, all right, mm. we're going to leave. Yeah, just <laughs> laughing. Yeah, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, Good one, that uh. was the important thing. You never directly, like, any time he said something like that, you immediately went, oh, yes, of course. So, for example, when Roshek laughed that first time when he came in, and he was like, oh, you were joking. Yeah. And then Roshek was like, yeah. yes, I am. You didn't go, no, I'm not. Maybe if you had, he wouldn't have been as nice if you'd actually said, yeah. excuse me, Mr. Mayor, you're full of shit. He might have <laughs> reacted differently. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. You can it's like, like you yeah, Rushing is like, ha ha, this man is crazy. I'm going to go. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> don't care. Yeah. Although yeah. I will reveal the reason he wanted you to stay is because he wanted you to talk at the festival and give people hope. That was the reason mm. you, did, you weren't going to leave. It's Inspire like, people. Yeah. Mm. Aw. Wow. I, I should have gone with my gut there. He was, he was yeah. kind of good. Kind of. I mean, he did have a guy like locked up. Kind of, up really, mm. He had a guy locked up on the upper floor who he was torturing every day. Oh, uh, okay. Well, oh, really? Yes. That was the. Uh, mm. Or the Good someone time. in the church would have told you that because the mother of that person was weeping in the church, hoping their son would be uh, let loose soon. <laughs> oh, I thought. Oh, okay. Uh, Interesting. Mm. There, it's always prices to pay for security. You know, I think. Yes. Yeah. I'm glad you found him morally ambiguous people. because he was supposed to be. So um, I definitely would say he yeah. probably isn't good. But yeah. it's like you said, was Lady Wachter any better? No, than you no, were? not really. Who you I mean, it, fe it, it feels very much like a sort of Middle East type scenario, right? Where it's like, you know, you have the dictator, you know, <laughs> who does bad things. And then uh, yeah. if you take that one out, then what happens? Then you get some chaos that you don't know. Uh, and it might turn out worse, which is what has maybe happened in, sometimes in reality. Awesome. And I guess it also kind of happened for us. Awesome. So, yeah. all right, we liked Argavost Holt, we liked Valakai, and let's maybe conclude... Oh. Kresik. Oh, did we like... Oh, tell me about Kresik. Ah, oh, Kresik was great. What a cool town. I mean, that was like the whole sort of misty place where the, the townspeople felt much more alive, where... Uh, Suddenly, Roman gets drawn in to deliver a baby, and they f find this. Uh, and and Roshik goes off and find this little calm spot near a pond that apparently is like the only place that has some sort of connection to to the Morning Lord that he finds later. Uh, and and then the whole just traveling up the hill or or the mountain, you know, it made me feel a lot uh, uh, like you know. Skyrim going up to towards the uh, hall of these shouting monks. Mm. <laughs> I don't remember what they're called. Sorry, uh, and uh, you know, getting up there and this epic feel of being high up, and these strange creatures tied up, uh, and I mean, all these characters and the abbot. It's like enigmatic. It turns out to be an angel. Uh, there's just so much going on there. It it felt so. Alive that town. Mm -hmm. I'm really yeah, glad you feel that way, um, especially because I thought it was a shame you didn't get to see more of the Abbey because you kind of um, saw, like, you went in and you went to one part, but then there was the whole other part, which, again, due to circumstance, we didn't end up seeing. Um, that, mm. That's a, that's a, another example of interesting decisions made by you guys. Made meant I made decisions that then I had to follow up on. So, for example, uh, having Esmeralda steal the thing. Because I was thinking, oh shit, they're leaving. Maybe they won't ever come back. Maybe I should have... Yeah, like, Esmeralda would totally do this. Yeah, she's done it. I kind of made the... She would do it. She's done it. She rolled the dice. And then obviously that had massive repercussions when you got down. It was like, what? You stole it? Give it back. No, we will not. <laughs> I don't remember the uh, the reason why we left. Did he send us send us to do something? Because I you... think we were supposed to get a dress, work. right? Yeah. He wanted a yes, wedding dress, right, yes. and he was going to go That's down it. and ask the people of the town, and you said you'd go and help. And then before yeah. we could even do that, the theft got discovered. And yes. Yes. And then we refused to return it, because, uh, of course, we're not going to return it now. We have it. It's, it's ours now. Exactly. <laughs> and then, of course, a certain lich attacked 
and that threw everything into <laughs> chaos and confusion. Yes. It was quite rude. So, we liked those places, but I think finally we have to talk about, of course, Castle Ravenloft. After all, it's the biggest dungeon equivalent you did in the adventure. It's the biggest sort of location, or at least one of them. And of course, it's the quintessential, especially in the old module. The adventure was just the castle and the village of Barovia. So yes, Matthias, how did you feel about Castle Ravenloft as a location and what occurred there? I think it's a, it's a very large place and it felt large. Uh, there was many different rooms and levels and we did see quite a bit of it. I, I have to say, I felt a little bit lost uh, most of the time, which is why when you listen to it, you will hear that I basically don't normally say like where to go. I will, like, if it's the stairs up or down, I don't normally know what to do. But other than that, I was kind of a little bit unsure where we were, which is why I think I let... Uh, uh, Roshek or uh, whoever was guiding us uh, at the time sort of take the lead. Um, but it, yeah, it really felt large, expansive. It felt like it was so much there that we probably didn't get to see. Um, but at the same time, it felt like we were able to move around it quite uh, well, which I hadn't necessarily expected. I probably expected it. it would be more, you know, tons of guards would be upon us immediately. But instead, like, the first time we get there, we're sort of greeted by someone, but then essentially we are allowed to explore it or we end up exploring it which was quite fascinating actually uh i guess like leading up to the wedding yeah mm mm yes i mean especially because i wanted to give the impression it wasn't like an actual fortress with like 20 guardsmen walking around every corridor it is a haunted castle it mm-hmm. has things going on in it there is some semblance of life as you then discovered but you had to find it sometimes it's just an empty old castle haunted by ghosts and shadows at least until the very end and only then when you finally were on the list of time to die Uh, and then it revealed its skeletons its whites its vampire spawn Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. yeah yeah yeah, because because I, I think I I was a little bit um, yeah that, that was a bit of a surprise actually that we could uh, we could explore it so freely, and that we we essentially ended up missing the wedding because um, I mean I of course we I wanted to avoid it but I didn't mm. think that we would actually be allowed to do it I think that I I think that I thought that some guards would show up and like you know sort of forcibly like get us over there. Uh, so in a way, I was like, "Oh shit, he's actually going to let us just go here." That was that was really cool. It really felt like we had agency to to really do what mm. we wanted, um, and to even sort of miss something that I suppose was supposed to be quite an epic uh, moment, uh, which I think you reminded us of a number of times after that uh, as well. <laughs> I did, but you know what? I'm glad it went that way because that's what I wanted. I wanted you to. I didn't. I didn't want to have. Oh, you come back. Because that's... No, you didn't want to. You wanted to go and find something. And you had a reason to do it as well. It's not like you just randomly went, let's explore. Like, it could happen in some cases. You had a reason. You were trying to find something. And mm-hmm. what a perfect time to try and find something to steal. Then when everyone's distracted, it made perfect logical sense. Mm. It was just quite that's funny. That's how I sold it to myself, yeah. I didn't think you'd do it. I thought, because I <laughs> thought... Like, Roshek especially was very keen to go to the wedding. And I thought Roman... Again, that was a good example of how Roman changed, because part of me thought, but Roman, there's an innocent to be saved. No, the mission is more important. Oh, Mm -hmm. and that's who you were, yeah. That's right. No, that's sort of like, it's kind of snowballed, really, from all our other things that happened before that. Mm -hmm. Felt like. Yes. So, yeah, yeah, but what do you think? But I mean, and Roshik really enjoyed the... Sorry. Oh, yes, Mm -hmm. right. Well, <laughs> Roshik did enjoy the uh, the fine dining. That was probably one of the highlights of, of <laughs> the whole stay in Borovia. <laughs> and the good wine and the good food. And, ah, yeah, that was nice. But uh, I also very much enjoyed the rooms that we ended up in. Like the accountant's room was very colourful. And and, uh, and also that bone room. Mm-hmm. Both of those. Um not to yeah, mention, you the, almost the, found the way to some hidden treasures. Almost. We found a little deck of cards. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about a certain room, the header chest, that wasn't obviously the correct chest, but 
there was a torch scone, which I said, yeah. one torch has a torch scone in it, and the other one has it on the ground. Had yeah. you put the torch scone and the in. Skeleton was, the skeleton held the torch, so yeah. I assumed like, I assumed that, oh, he had taken down the torch from the torch scone, and then activated a trap and died. So I better not touch, touch the, sco- the torch. That ah, was my... That makes sense. It was actually, if you put the torch scone back in, it would open the secret passage that led further uh. to some of the treasure vaults. But we'll say no more mm. on that. And the little and part and maybe some more spiders and some more secret rooms. I'm glad and you even found was... it because I was saying I really don't want to spell out the poker. But I was really like keen to like, you would notice, oh, there's a poker. You could put it somewhere. How interesting. That's the only main object in the room. And you did. I was like, yay. <laughs> <laughs> and this is when I was like hanging out outside the fireplace, just like looking around and like letting uh, Rushik go in by himself. Right? Yeah. I like that decision. Because <laughs> hmm. again, I, it, could, it showed it you a little bit of, bad, yeah, right? the castle had lots of secret passages and a few secret chambers. And obviously we hadn't really mm. seen any. And I was like, oh, can we maybe see one? And you did. It's fun also that I did two performance checks throughout the whole uh, campaign, and both were quite good. Like, both the drumming the drums and uh, then playing the harp. Yeah, I hope that wasn't too <laughs> leading, because I was a bit like... Because you're the one who noticed and said it would be fun to play, and I was like, yeah, do you want to play it? You, you could totally play it. If you play it, something happens. <laughs> I didn't say that, though. I didn't, I, and I didn't really believe that something would happen. That's cool. I man. was more, yeah, no, I, I, uh, no, I know. I thought that was cool. That, that was interesting. That I like that. I, I, in general, yes, I, I did like, I did enjoy Ravenloft and the tours that we took through it. That was cool. Yeah. What I, about this uh, scratched out text of, uh, 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 above the armors? Oh, oh, that was literally just old text. Like it probably said something like, oh, okay. "Sir." Gunston scene or something. It was literally just it's been scratched out because of age. Because everything mm. in there was supposed to be at least four or five hundred years old by that point. <laughs> so it's not like speak friend and these armors will help you forever. No, no. If anything, uh, the trap there was if you step right up to investigate the statues, they would have swung their axes at your head. Oh, nice ooh, simple. Good trap. that we did not do that then. A nice simple trap. Quite literally, even says not designed to actually kill you, just as a fun trap because Strahd had lots of little fun traps for his own amusement. <laughs> hmm. Fun traps. Like yes. when he we appeared on the uh, stairway when you were going down, and you were like, "Shit, quick, Strahd's here!" That's just an illusion that will trigger to do exactly <laughs> that, make you freak out. Yeah. Just for Strahd's shits and giggles. Yes. There's also one. That's why we should have when the, when the undead came storming through that hall. We should have just shouted towards the armors. Esmeralda, come out of the armor. Maybe the undead would have run up to the armor and get slaughtered. Ah, yes. <laughs> yes, yeah. How did we feel about that? I did feel a bit... I was worried that those last bits of running away would feel a bit forced. It was because of pacing, because you probably can imagine there was nothing stopping you fighting all those things. They, they were all boss fights. The brides mm. were a boss fight. The armor could be a boss fight. I was originally planning on having you fight it properly, um, and then it was only because of pacing that I kind of went, actually, maybe that would feel a bit off. But what, what did you think? I think it worked nicely. I mean, they nice. felt uh, menacing, and, and um, like uh, it felt like we, could, we wouldn't really be able to take him on and that we would get um, crowded and, and killed. So like running away felt like very much the... The, the logical thing to do. And then, of course, we had something that we wanted yeah. to achieve and we didn't want to expand our, you know, my spells and our, our uh, hit points and all that. We didn't want to expend that before actually getting, uh, making it to to the Count himself. So I felt like it, yes. it was a very natural decision to make and it, it's good that the... Because it's just two of us, you know, so it, it feels... I think it's good that you had plenty of times when it sort of felt like, no, you're in over your head here, you have to get out. That that feels yeah. logical. And that makes the the castle feel more, uh, you know, threatening, which it should cool. feel because it is cool. I'm really happy, yeah. especially because I wanted to have them because I was thinking of cutting them entirely, and I was just a bit like, oh, I really love the armor. I re- well, the, I mean, the brides are actually supposed to be in his tomb. When you oh. go to the tomb, they're supposed to be there. But I was like, oh, I, don't, oh, I was a bit like, I don't want another big. But at that point, I wanted it to be a nice cinematic moment, not a battle against three vampires. It's also why I changed the trap. The spike trap you've activated is not a spike trap. Ooh, it's a teleportation trap. Ooh. 
it teleports you into one of the tombs filled with whites. And hey. you, you, go, you go into it, and you're in a coffin surrounded by other coffins that will have whites that will soon attack you, and you have to climb out and fight them. But then the white that was in your coffin gets teleported to the other players. So they have a fight with a white that suddenly appears where you are, and you are having a fight where you're potentially going to be completely surrounded. <laughs> wow. Wow. What, which trap was this, was this again? The last Sorry. one before you step in the tomb. Yep. Oh. Yeah, there were spikes there. I had spikes, but really, it's, it makes sense. He's Strahd. It is a Strahd-based trap. It's like, fuck you, you're not coming in my tomb. But I, mm-hmm. f- again, for pacing, was like, I don't really want you to get teleported into a tomb at this point. <laughs> No, I was, I was just going to say it was a fun scene there with Strahd uh, resting in his coffin and uh, then the the bolt, the guiding bolt towards him, mm. basically causing a sort of, you know, the scene in um, a vampire's diary, an interview with a vampire, as that was called, uh, you know, when he is pouring gasoline over all the coffins and yes. setting fire to the place and they, they burst out burning in flames from their coffins. <laughs> kind of that because I think my idea yeah, I mean, was not like I, I think I was sort of set on this idea that of course fire can kill vampires too you, they can burn yeah, yeah? so like it yeah, makes yeah, sense yeah. that I just go with like a supercharged guiding bolt and I just burn this asshole where he lies yeah. but then yeah I guess I could have staked him and I guess that's what we ended I, up doing, it was so more it, it was Strahd <laughs> I think yeah. any other vampire you'd have yeah how you saw how we saw it in a recent trailer of course that would work mm. but it's because it was Strahd and it was like no that just gives him no <laughs> mm. he needs to have his final resting place stake thing it's a supernatural thing uh, that's right exactly. and also right. I didn't say nothing happened he totally he was on fire yeah. his skin oh, was burning off. Yeah, he was yeah, like yeah, ah. sure <laughs> yeah, no, because right. it was it was a it sort was a of cool shocking scene. shocking moment there, and, I, and he was like, "Oh shit, what have I done?" And then like, oh, I'm rushing to try and stake him, and then like, rolling two fumbles or something like that. I think yeah, I rolled two ones, <laughs> which yeah. was brilliant because it was just that perfect image of you. Even though he was on fire and dead, he still had it. That was his strength. He could still throw you off. It was only then Roshek being, "No, I am stronger right now." And that was a perfect. Uh, that it, I'll admit, I did want Roshik to get the blow because I wanted to have that final little line to Roshik. I was happy with that line. Hmm. What was it again? It was him laughing and going, "If it could have been anyone, yes, it could have been yeah. you." Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I. Uh, it really feels like there's a, there's a lot going on in. in in the campaign and, and there were loads of stuff that we could have uh, done differently I, and I like that it's 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 a it's not a bad feeling and uh, mm-hmm. and I agree with what we said before that we it didn't feel forced that we skipped some of them because we we were very strongly driven characters mm. and some and again some of the things you did do instead led to interesting things the accountant scene you're right I loved it yeah. I was completely off cuff. I was like literally just reading it straight from the book and that was it. Because I was like, they, went, they actually went to that room? Oh God. Uh, and, the, and it was really funny. It yeah, was. It was great. Really I was. loved it. It was yeah. great. Mm. Of course, and the Strahd same has with to have the... someone running his books. Of course. Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Fun character. <laughs> and Strahd on the road. And the, yeah, like the encounter with Vistani, as I said, at the tavern is completely, that's not in the, the adventure at all. I made that up to represent, again, choices. The werewolf running from the werewolves constantly. Oh yeah. <laughs> uh, oh, that was cool. Some of the fates of the characters, the fates of the towns, uh, and of course, good old Kazan. He that was fun because he is in the adventure, is in his tower is, and everything he's done is. But he's been dead for centuries and is never seen again. It was only because of Roman's personal backstory that I thought, hang on a minute, maybe he isn't dead. Maybe he's back. That's right. Mm. He's a lich. And then, of course, you smashed his phylactery very nicely there. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I see. So he wasn't originally a lich. He originally becomes a lich, goes to the Amber Temple, which is where the actual lich is and all the big secret dark magics are, and tries to become an arch lich and fails miserably. And when you fail miserably at that, you just disintegrate. 
Yeah. So he did exist. He his tower was Kazan's tower. He was one of the architects of Castle Ravenloft and did lots of things for the Count to make his magic stuff, uh, including when he became a vampire. He still helped him a bit. He was supposed to destroy mm. the sword. He failed, and so just sort of hid it instead. Or, or in my case, in this adventure, I said one of the good guardsmen saved the sword. But um, his original thing is that's why the sword hates him, Kazan specifically, because mm. it destroyed mm. his hilt. No, not the, the blade. It wasn't always a sun blade. It used to be a proper sword. Oh. And he destroyed the blade. Yes. Uh, and so that's y- just sort of the will of the sword materialised. Yeah, exactly. It makes itself a sun blade. Yeah. But it's yeah. still really upset that it's been damaged in the first place. And then Kazan <laughs> is gone. Uh, there is an arch, the lich in the adventure, but he, Exantha, but he is at the Amber Temple. Where we did Which not we go. never entered. Yeah. But you were close to it at one point. It was like, oh my god, yeah. that place feels super evil. We should mm. definitely not yeah, go it was there. Yeah, scary, and uh, it was frightening too with the uh, rock or whatever it was that attacked us there in the mountains. It was. It's basically. It's a shame you didn't go, but it wouldn't, because basically it's a cool temple of evil with tons of evil in it, and you can then make all sorts of evil bargains, much like the one Roshek accidentally made. But that, that's where mm. they are made properly. There's no accidents there. You are yeah. told what you're getting. You could become a lich. You can become a vampire. It, it says in the book, if those two things happen, you can't play those characters anymore. But they can happen. <laughs> <laughs> That's also, cool. to become a lich is really hard. It's like they have to be like the equivalent of like a level 20 character, have this spell casting yeah. ability, have all this stuff. <laughs> wow. Yeah. It's like something you well, come and, back and to later on. And then arch lich? How do you become an arch lich oh, and what's the difference? God. I don't think you... Arch Lich is like a Lich that's lived for a very long time and become even more powerful, almost losing all its humanity. They're basically the giant floating skull Liches. You, oh. There was one in Mask of the Betrayer. Like, it's a giant floating skull. Huh. Huh. Never play that. Aserak is supposed to be one, but then kind of isn't at the same time, depending on your huh. adventure. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. and it was, and that's why I we did the little thing with the red eyes because that was reflecting that yeah, dark pacts. There's a whole big list of them. Um, you get something and then you pay a cost. It's always yeah. a cost. Um, but yes, yeah, so Kazan, he was fun. Again, I had to underpower him a bit because he was he in a way could have been even more powerful than Strahd because the liches are quite powerful. So I was a bit like, well, I don't want to have that happening. <laughs> yeah, he felt like mm. he felt very dangerous just from you know killing the celestial. Mm. Yeah, and it was uh, it was a fight that it felt like yeah we went we we came pretty close. I mean, I think I expended pretty much everything I had uh, in, in that one, so it felt good to finally end him, and it felt nice and epic. And you oh, earned yeah, that's it. that's true. Yeah, the final fight with him. Because yeah. I think you were thinking he'd come back. He would have. But it was going to take him two days. And you then, from that point, rested and did everything else in the game in one day. Yeah. Really? Was it that quick? Right. You, you started in the morning. You rode out. Valakai, the Vistani, midday. And you got to the castle around nine, ten o'clock. And then you fought all night, all the way till six in the morning. Because huh. so when you described the phylactery, I, 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 I immediately thought that okay, that's probably it's probably <laughs> it's probably phylactery, uh, but I, uh, I, I, at the same time, I, I thought that he would have come back by then, so that I, I, I wasn't completely sure. You roll a d10. I did hmm. two days. <laughs> hmm. Ah, hmm. okay. Cool. Rules, guys. There's actual rules. He doesn't just come back nice. whenever. It's you roll a d10, he will return at his phylactery in that time, and it was two. Hmm. Hmm. I think it's really nice that you uh, you do all that and that you really let that um, determine the story. That's that's really cool. Because, uh, yeah. you know, in a podcast, it's very easy to sort of fall into the whole, like, let's just do the narrative and screw it. Hmm. Um, but it's nice that, you know, you let the dice actually decide it in a way. You that's had cool. that, yeah. yeah. And I was very happy with the result. Um, and if you're wondering, because some viewers might be like, but wait, why was his phylactery in such a, well, not easy to find place, but, for, you know, it wasn't that guarded by itself. It's because Strahd was in control of the phylactery, which is why 
the Lich was doing what he was told in the first place, otherwise he would not. <laughs> hmm. Yeah, of course. Makes sense. Mm. Makes sense. Mm. Uh, speaking of characters, let's move on to the characters. Any memorable yes. NPCs that will remain with you? So yeah, we talked about the locations. <laughs> what about the NPCs? I mean, the the Baron certainly um, will will remain. Um, and then uh, I really liked Otto. I thought Otto was delightful. Uh, obviously, he's <laughs> not a yeah. very nice uh, being, really. Uh, I understand that he <laughs> did some horrible things after we had left, but. Uh, he was he was very fun in the moment. <laughs> Who was the first one you mentioned? Uh, the Baron, uh, so the mayor of Valakai. The Baron, yes, yes, yes. yes. He's, of course, we talked about well. him already, and he's uh, he's uh, delightful yeah. as well in in a very sort of scary uh, way. Yeah, Otto was fun. I loved your uh, characterization of Bazrog, the ogre. Oh yeah, he's great. Uh, the the. Uh, you just found a really good combination uh, of comedy and uh, menacing presence, you know? Yeah. It was like, he was fun, but there's something there. He's also threatening. Mm-hmm. It was it was really, really good. Yeah. <laughs> that was a lot of fun, especially because obviously that came totally from you. I mean, you, you didn't tell me yeah. to do it, but you kept mentioning the ogre. And one day yeah. I just thought, let's have the ogre. Let's go with the ogre. <laughs> see what happens and 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 we got a bit of backstory because again the biggest problem with this adventure was bringing in your backstories like i said now you understand the way the adventure works that you get no connection to your actual lives you are in a completely alien environment so things like i'm a member of this guild or i hate this guy in that town like were very hard to pull off so i had had to rely on the magic realism if you will and Mm -hmm. then basrog came and i was like Let's see what happens if you talk to Basrog. And the answer was you totally had a whole episode where you were like, explained, um, oh yeah, how I left those guys behind. And that all got quite... Yeah. 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 Yeah, and how did you feel then, Kamar? Because I was hoping like, oh, I hope you don't feel I'm dictating your backstory to you i thought like oh this no is- you definitely mm. did him justice mm. and you know uh i didn't make um i didn't make uh Roshik talk much about his past and i also didn't reflect it in in the things that i did uh like uh, like you chose to do matthias with with your uh with your things where you, where you you brought them up yourself and and you said i don't remember the name of of the woman uh but but I, mes- I remember you mentioning an, a name of a person like oh please forgive me mm. yeah mm. and uh, and stuff like that which made it probably easier to like uh, put a, uh, a pin on, on on what you you are and what you come from so th- there wouldn't have been much connection I think seeing how both characters were striving so much forwards and. Uh, uh, it it felt it felt like uh, Roman really didn't want to know too much about Roshik's past, or him, or he wasn't like curious. Oh, how how is it in an orc clan? How does that work? How was it growing up? How was how was your your how was it to have a a, a human mother and an orc father and uh, that stuff like that? The uh, he he wasn't curious about me. So the only um, it, 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 I I think it it, it helped giving. A bit more flavor, except from the stories that he already was telling. I also character. thought it was a fun <laughs> DM kick in the face because obviously you'd explained it as Basrog and he was great and there was nothing bad. And then I was like, "Hear about the truth, yeah. Yama? How about the truth? Where yeah. actually Basrog got left to die?" Yeah. And and then the, your character going, "Shit, yeah, I don't." Talk about that part of the story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that was great. Yeah. I love that. Um, yeah, no, Basil was fun. I love the Baron. What did we think of our main cast then? So that would be Irina, yeah. Ismark, Esmeralda, Van Richten. <laughs> oh, yeah, they're very memorable, well, all Esm- of them. You know, Ismark, yes. uh, I, I liked. We had a very fun moment with Ismark when you cut out once and <laughs> yes <laughs> we sort of improvised a fight with Ismark and everything. No, we liked Ismark <laughs> he was he was a fun one uh it's sad what happened to him and sad that I chased him away there I feel a bit bad about that but uh you know casualties of war and all that 
Well, he, he didn't die, so no, I mean, that's right. he's. Uh, that's right. We wonder what's happened. I, I mean, that was kind of special. I mean, that she didn't actually destroy him either. No. I uh, I really liked them. I I loved Esmeralda and I loved uh, Rudolph too. They were really strong characters with lots of uh, if, if, lots of things going on in, in them. It, it, they were they were a true pleasure to to be around and to sort of do the adventure uh, with them. Yeah, I liked how they sort of came in and out of of what we did as well. They weren't always there, but. Mm kind of made a relief when whenever they hmm. came because they were quite competent both of them exactly and um i really quite liked also with irena that she wasn't just a damsel in distress but that she was you know she was described as, as sort of a competent fighter herself hmm. and um yeah um i was actually really looking forward to sort of going out adventuring with her but then the count showed up and ah he took her Yes, that's the mm. biggest struggle with the adventure is that at one point it, it's not impossible. It shouldn't be, obviously. It should totally be possible to get her to a certain point, but she has the dice rolled against her. Um, especially there's lots of things that are... For example, you got away. That like, at, Well, actually, you were going to get away. That was the sad thing. It was only Xiaomar reminding me that the horse was dead that stopped you getting away. <laughs> Otherwise, I'd God, you have actually rode off. You've got past the zombies. You're going to m- probably make it. He probably would only chase you for a bit and then kind of retreat for now and come back later. But obviously then the horse fell down. You fell down. <laughs> I was like, ah, oh, there we go. Yeah, I remember thinking, yeah. Yalmar, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> no, but of course Traitor. it would make sense. I mean, the horse does get barbecued uh, as well in that mm. scenario. There's um, something very interesting that happens if you get her to Kresik, which is, again, interesting. Um, but then there are things you can do and she totally it is I mean hell you might have even saved her at the wedding <laughs> maybe oh maybe oh don't say <laughs> that I thought for <laughs> sure that she was a, a goner haha <laughs> <laughs> ah uh, yeah what did we think comparing uh, Irina to Esmeralda I felt they were my two main uh, NPCs if you will that really other than Van Richten were story important and I really wanted them to feel different I was a bit worried that the accent might make them feel exactly the same but uh I hope they came across as different, strong characters. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah definitely. I mean, Irina felt more like sort of tragic. Um, yeah, more of a tragic uh, character, whereas uh, Esmeralda was more like sort of the the rogue uh, who kind of snuck around and got stuff done, you know? Mm. And of yeah, course, and he, Muriel. She, she was like... Oh, Muriel as well, yeah. Yeah, she, well, I mean, she had a very... I, I think... Um, Esmeralda had a very strong drive, whereas uh, Irina had more given up on most things. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely felt that they come across as very different characters. Yeah, That's cool. And yeah, I, I actually wish I'd done a bit more with Muriel. I kind of felt she vanished a bit. That, that was kind of why she made a later comeback for one more scene. Because I was like, ah, oh, she was kind of watching the nice. whole time at the start. Yeah. And the Bertie bit. That was hilarious. Uh, yeah. I loved that. <laughs> Bertie, the <laughs> raven. Yep. Because you were yeah. so sure, like, he's my friend, and he's totally my friend. That's I've assumed this, and I was like, this is great. <laughs> yeah, he's the only one that... I'm the only one that can see him, that notice that he's continually around. Good old Bertie. Just... Ravens are lucky because they've told me so. <laughs> so this must be a good... It could totally not have been, Perhaps, but it turned out that he was probably a good person there. Perhaps moving on and, uh, onto the antagonist side of things, so we'll leave Strahd for a second, but what do we think of the minor hmm. villains? Our, uh, our Vistanis, our werewolves, our uh, random ghost people, a whole bunch of vampires you just chased away each time. <laughs> mm. Yeah, no, I think they were... Uh, I liked uh, Rahadin, for example. I thought he was... He was very yeah. cool, very strong. I mean, we met him a few times, and uh, he was, uh, he felt very threatening just also because he was an elf, and yeah, <laughs> liked, I liked him Just a lot. because he was an elf? Yeah, just because <laughs> he's such a, like, an elf serving a vampire, it just seems so, yeah. yeah, like, unexpected in a way. So, like, it feels like he must be very, very powerful. 
And I mean, he yeah. was. And also because he doesn't, he wasn't undead. No. He, I mean, he wasn't a vampire. And there was another he, thing, right? He, he, was, was, he was doing this by his own free will, I guess. Yeah, or for, for whatever other reason, that must be, yeah. yeah he came, I agree. He, he was very menacing. I, I, uh, I wasn't, I, I was a bit worried about uh, meeting him. Yeah, because I, mean, I don't know if Rushik was, but I, 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 I definitely felt that. Oh, the whole, uh, just him having this aura of screams that tear at you with psychic damage, and not a little psychic damage either. Mm. Yeah, Besides right. from him having a few attacks per turn, that did. Yeah, he was really of damage. He, he just felt he, very. He dangerous. had free just, attacks and go free with his scimitar. Yeah, which was a plus ten to hit. Mm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Because mm. yeah, that fight in the tower was also, I mean, another sort of big, I mean, that was a really big moment that uh, that was super cool. And I mean, I think he was a big part of that uh, and making that yeah. fight really feel very difficult and, and feeling like we just got through it um, with our, yeah. our, our lives somehow. So, yeah. Yeah, it was really cool with all those uh, priests and stuff and other smaller vampires there as well. Um it was like you said, Craig. At some point, that we somehow took a road route that led us away from uh, a lot of the vampires, and it didn't give the feeling that it, it it sort of gave you the feeling that Strad was sort of the vampire. But then we came across this weakling at the start, of course, but didn't feel like that there were many others. But then, as they sort of surfaced there towards the end, that's yes, but, well, cool. yes, I liked I liked that a lot because especially after I, I thought it was great a great image of. We killed him, and then I'm like, so three more enter the room, and from the walls, that's another four, five. Basically, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they're all coming because they're like, what the fuck? <laughs> mm-hmm. mm. um, that's right. And yes, I mean, if you want, I'll f- throw it in now. Y- would you like to know a bit? More? Like, you-, you seem intrigued why was Rahadin serving him. I can answer that if you want. Yeah, definitely. We'd love mm-hmm. to know. Rahadin had sworn loyalty to the whole family 400 years ago. Oh. Uh, he swore wow. it to his father, King Barov, and then to his son, Strad. Uh, and Barov, King Barov, saw, wanted to then regard Rahadin as a family member, almost like my a son, and see Strad as your hmm. brother. So Rahadin saw Strad not only as his loyal uh, master, master of the land, before he was a vampire and continuing, but also as a brother. Hmm. So, so what would have happened if we opened the king's uh, casket? The king's casket. His, not the casket, but uh, the grave with the king. You didn't find um. Oh, that was a different king. Oh, I mean, you didn't actually see the family tomb. Uh, you, you, if you open the tomb of King Barov, you will find a rotting corpse of King Barov. <laughs> oh. And his queen next to him. Yes. <laughs> So yes, and being an elf who lives can live forever almost to a point that you know they live thousands of years, and someone who swears an oath, he upheld his oath. He would never break it, even if his master became a blood sucking abomination. Hmm. Makes sense. Makes sense. That's um, yeah. So he sort of made the the pact at a time when they were not, uh, you know the. Hmm. The evil that uh, that Strahd is, but probably more, I guess, normal rulers. Um, so yeah, it makes normal sense. Normal rulers, sense. perhaps a bit conquery. Strahd was a conqueror, a right. warrior, but he was doing it for his cause, you know, you know, as all conquerors do. He didn't think he was being evil about it. He was conquering a land. And then Rahadin uh, upheld his honor and protected him and killed many, many, many people. That was the order of screams about him. Uh, and uh, also helped uh, screw up all the other Dusk Elves in the uh, realm, who mm. you never met, but there were other Dusk Elves. Not many, because he killed all the females. Mm. Hmm. That's so not they nice. never have new children, so all the remaining Dusk Elves in Barovia, or there's only maybe about 20, uh, live together and just live forever, but can never have children or romantic companionship. Hmm. Or if they do, wow. it's with each other, but it still doesn't make any kids, unfortunately. So their race will eventually, as they die, die. Hmm. That's dark. That's tragic. Why did he do that? Yeah. Just because? That was or... because one of them tried to be a bride of Strahd. Uh, she had her own intentions in doing so, but um, 
obviously Raya didn't like that. Then when she got sort of found out, he, they, the village, the, the, the um, actual Dark Elves themselves, not Dark Elves, Dusk Elves, kill her because they don't want her becoming a Bride of Strahd. It's like, we'd rather you die than be his, even though that's what she wanted. Uh, they kill her. Strahd's pissed because he wanted a bride. And so Rahadin's like, yeah, okay, I'm going to come over and kill all your women because you uh, denied my master what he wanted. Wow, he is committed to his master, huh? even uh, yes, even dooming his own uh, his own species in a way. That's, uh, that's exactly. Yeah. And Casimir, the leader of that faction, if you met him, has his ears mutilated, his oh. elven ears. They've been chopped off to insult him even oh. further. <laughs> what a douche! It's good that he's dead. Yes, he was a bit of a douche. Uh, exactly, <laughs> and I'm really glad you liked him because yeah, I really loved the. <laughs> Half breed, because <laughs> no one else called you out on it. Everyone else was just afraid of you being a half orc. But I, he's a fucking superiority elf complex to the extreme. He'd be totally half orc. <laughs> yeah, you're kind of scum. <laughs> he felt like he, uh, it, yeah, it, it felt like he had a sort of personal vendetta almost. But everyone else, what did everyone else call me? Like monster and stuff. Everyone else called you monster and beast man, but it wasn't yeah. really because you were half orc. It's just because you weren't human, which, as you noticed, yeah. everyone was human except a few elves that you didn't meet, and that's it. There was no no hmm. dwarves, no halflings, no no you know no goblins, no orcs in this realm. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and then maybe, I mean, they didn't get quite as a spotlight because, they, you know, castle NPCs are a bit hard to give too much. But what did we think of the random nice vampire and his friendly little mechanical man? Oh, they were, they were lovely. They were delightful. Absolutely delightful. Oh, uh, yeah, those P- were strange. They I totally liked. didn't use you for their own ends. No, of course they didn't. No, of course not. But, uh, no, no, they were, uh, that was nice. That was nice. And then, uh, did you, having, uh, I, that was a fun scene. Around. I was wondering how you'd react to the, oh, by the way, the portal. Yeah, I thought you'd try and use it. They've used it. And then it gets exploded. <laughs> I think at that point I was just like, no, uh, uh, screw it. Let's go somewhere. <laughs> just get out of here. <laughs> Didn't have too much time to, yeah. to hate them for doing that. Yes. And finally, I suppose we'll end NPC unless unless you have anything else, any other NPCs? Mm, no. no, I think that's that's pretty good, right? Cool. Let's end it then yeah. with Strahd, the main villain. Everything was his plan. The big character to play the in D and D lore, really big, really famous. He's up there with Elminster and you know and at Asarak and all the famous characters. He is the quintessential vampire of D and D. What hmm. do we think? How would I do? I mean, he uh, he doesn't come across as like being some. Uh, he's not sort of a stereotypical, just uh, laughing maniacally kind of thing. He is. I mean, we could reason with him, and we could like have a conversation with him, which was nice. Uh, he didn't just want to kill us all of a sudden. He was uh, like he was interested in getting to know who we were, and it seemed like he was in a way interested in maybe even winning us over to his side. Uh, and that we could perhaps even be his servants somehow, which was uh, sort of a cool prospect to, to consider. Yeah. Um, and and uh, I, I certainly sort of played on that a little bit in the conversation that we had with him there, uh, which was uh, which was quite interesting. And yeah, like it, he, he felt like he was a real, a real person in a way. Like he was, uh, he had a reason for being there. He had something that he wanted, um, and we were part of his plan and then we became a little bit of a nuisance. Uh, but, uh, but it was always interesting interactions with him. You never really yeah. knew what he was going to do. Yeah, exactly. He was like very curious and very testing every possibility that he got. Very playful in a way. Hmm. Nice. It was hard. I, I especially... <laughs> the last conversation I did have to try and stop myself being a bit too expositiony because I just was like, this is the last time and then you're going to fight. <laughs> but so he was a bit more like, I know I will say this and this, but uh, you know, I hope it, I, I think it, you know, he, you, you, you eventually interrupted him and that was it. I was like, fair enough battle on. So, <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. 
I, it worked. It worked. No, really nice. I, he was great. I, I think you you made him stand out a lot from from everything else we encountered, and I, I really liked his voice. Oh, thank uh, you. That was hard to do. <laughs> Good evening. I am being Transylvanianish and really <laughs> gruff, but also slow and commanding. <laughs> 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 ah, you're so yeah, good at that's that. Great. That's great. Excellent. Ah, yeah. No, I miss him. He his his biggest thing is supposed to be he doesn't sit in his castle and wait for you to come to him. The whole adventure is Strad is active. Strad eventually will go out and start doing things, whether the heroes want him to or not. And it's but that was supposed to be the feeling, like rather than someone like, for example, Asarak and. Uh, some his adventures. He's a uh, he's at the end of the dungeon. He sits around waiting for you and then laughs and goes ha 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 and then you attack him. That sort of thing. You know, like the classic villain who waits until the very end to reveal everything. That sort of thing. Mm. You're supposed to be different. He's supposed to be actively coming to get you. Yeah, it did feel like that. I mean, it felt like we were actively brought there for uh, his enjoyment, and he was very curious about us. Mm. That's so, right. in that case, moving on. I, I mean, we may I have already to say among the NPCs actually, one NPC <laughs> more is uh, Adam Ava, Madam Ava. Ah uh, yes, <laughs> oh, of course. She left such a sour taste at the end there. It was like I was so expecting her to just give praise and that we fulfilled our purpose and all is well in Borovia now. <laughs> but no. We failed. Sorry. And and did you like how nonchalant she was about it? Almost as if she knew it already. So it wasn't even a surprise. Yes. She was like, Ah, oh, here you are. Oh, you actually think you've won. <laughs> oh, you didn't. Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You failed. And everything would have start again anyway. So even if you had won, it just wouldn't have mattered, really. So do what you want to do. And then but you did. Roman was like, Okay, I ride off. <laughs> yeah, I'm done here. Yeah. I have done what I yeah. was supposed to do. Yes, I will not have changed things forever, but what is forever anyways? You know, <laughs> everything is temporary mm. in our lives. So if it's for six months, okay, I'm okay with that. If I have mm. given these people six months of life, then that is something, you know, I can, as one person, I can be proud of that and I can go back. How about we yeah. spring off that then and move straight into we're nearly there. Uh, the end. What about the end? How did you feel about where you left your character? Did it feel justified? So yeah, the end of the adventure. How are we feeling? Mm. Yeah, I feel that it was very open. Um, I'm 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 not I'm not sure really what to make of it other than that it was a goodbye to Roshik uh, for me. Uh, I feel a bit bad for him like he didn't I don't know if he deserved it <laughs> if it's justified that he ended up where he did but at the same time I'm not completely sure where he's actually ended up you know I, I, is he doomed to be stuck in some sort of limbo of his new masters or that are just going to enjoy his torment or will he eventually sort of break free from it and will he ever find his way back to Puffy the horse again. <laughs> it's fun that we found out the yes. name of the horse, by the way, at the end. I thought that was great. Finally. <laughs> You've got to have a last episode final revelation. <laughs> with with Robert, it was he'd always... He was the one who let his son die. With Roshek, the horse's name. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And yeah, Roman, how did you feel? Yeah, I think we talked about it before, but I think it feels uh, it feels fitting. It feels like uh, a good consequence, and feels like the right thing for Roman to go through in a way. That it feels like that will hopefully fix him in a way and make him be able to move forward, to come to terms with everything, and and then maybe to actually have a good life. It feels like there's hope, as I said, even though it, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, going to the spine of the world and trying to fend off all the horrors that are over there, but. But I have faith that he will, you know, he will do his best and that, that he will come through it and he will, he will find a new life again. Uh, I, I believe mm. that. I choose to believe that. Lathander yeah. would want that. I just, I just feel the same way that you, you want to 
I mean, you want to feel some sort of hope for the characters. It's the same in the uh, last campaign. It's like you wanna, you wanna feel that oh, it something, something else is will come about. It will be, it will be fine. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely feel that I felt Roman got, or you, I would consider a good ending. I yeah. had some far worse endings for you. Ah, oh, I wanted you to die. There was so much fun that was going to happen when you died. Because you were going to refuse. That was fine. You were then going to be... I had a, yeah. a few scenarios. So there was the one where when you refused and you actually were dead, immediately you were thrown into the massive vat of souls that forever dwells around Barovia. Uh, and I was going to leave you there for a few minutes just to be like, that's the end of Roman. Because it's like, you don't get resurrected by the evil guys. <laughs> You're dead. Forever. <laughs> forever. And then Van Richten did have a scroll of resurrect life. It's a very specific thing he's given. He only has one. He had it the whole time. <laughs> and it's just, uh, but nothing's free in Ravenloft. So even if that scroll was used, you were gazing, basically going to feel like your soul was wrenched in two. And then when you came back to life, your body was going to be super ravaged by time. You were basically going to age about 40 years. So you were going to be old man Roman. So you'd be alive. Uh-huh. But old man Roman, and you're going to be forever haunted by the image of your son. Because, again, that son bit would have happened in death. And he was forever going to be imprinted in your mind. Not just as an inconvenience, but as a permanent psychosis. <laughs> wow, that's dark, Craig. I'm glad that didn't I happen. know! <laughs> God damn, you, you, you were fine. Or, or, you didn't die, but you did the same thing Roshik did. You were going to go to the Amp Temple, and you were going to be given your son back. Uh, and of course, you would then be giving back your son for about five minutes, no tricks, and then he'd just die again. Aww. And then the dark powers would assure you that you can have it back as many times as you want for five minutes, and that it'll <laughs> always die horribly, and then they'd laugh, and then you were also going to be trapped like Roshek, and your quest would be maybe you'll find a way to get him back, Roshek, maybe you'll find a way to beat us, maybe you'll find a way to bring the Lord of Light to this <laughs> land. So no, you got off fine. And for Roshik, on the other side of things, your happier ending was going to be you being in a tavern, <laughs> looking down at your drink. No quest, no no meaning. But then some yeah. bandits come in, or some there's trouble on the road. And what do you do? And that would have been your, like, continuing adventures. <laughs> yes, together with Puffy. Hmm. Oh hell, you could have stayed yeah. with Esmeralda and done that. That was a massive surprise, viewers. I was like, really? You want to stay with Esmeralda and fight vampires? Cool. Didn't think, I thought you wanted to go, I, I thought for sure you'd be like, I'm done here. Let's go home. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. No. No? Yeah, that, that was a, <laughs> it was a funny episode. Mm. It was a bit of back and forth there, and, and I hesitated for one bit there that I was actually going to go uh, as well. But then something changed oh. my mind, and no. What did you? Oh, oh I see. Cool. Because because I, I thought that that could have been really cool for Roshik to have him be, you know, to have him then have this purpose of basically defeating strong foes. That because that's what he was, you know, seeming yeah. to to really like to do. Mm. And yeah. here he could he could fight until you know at the end of his days. He would have no lack yeah. of strong foes to take on together with Esmeralda and you know yeah. Mural would be about as well. So you know it seemed seemed cool, yeah. Exactly. And it's very and I, occasionally I, there's good wine. Yeah. And very rarely there is good food too. And I actually think if you had been like Roman and just again it said no that could have been fine but mm. you didn't but again choices 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 because the biggest thing was I mean it didn't end up happening but I was always going to say if you died the first time it was never going to be you're dead there was always going to be a way out of it somehow either saying yes or if you said no there were other, like, you know, maybe maybe you'd have fallen and broken all your limbs, I mean, on the top of that roof, dead. But then maybe mm. Roman would have found you. He had Revivify. You know, that the whole point of that spell is bring someone back to life as long as they've only been dead for, like, five minutes, right? Yeah. Yep. Mm. Yeah. 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 I, uh... Yeah. If I had known that, and if I had considered, you know, that what would happen if Roman actually died... 
uh, except for him just not being able to be in the adventure anymore. Mm. I don't, I, I am, I don't know if I would have acted differently. I think uh, though you acted in character, and that's all that matters. Yeah. When the moment came, Roshek didn't question the help. He was, you know, why would he? Yes, help me, help me. Roman had his faith thing, his little conviction thing yeah. where I'll never say yes, I'll never say yes. And he kept it, even even though his son was being offered, and that was the biggest thing, because I, I thought yeah. there was a chance, Matthias, mm-hmm. that you would, that maybe you would give in to save your son. But you didn't. Yeah. You didn't. Now, and I, and I think that sort of goes back into into the fact that he... Again, this this uh, this weakness side, this cowardice side, this that he would rather yeah. save himself, mm. Mm. which is Very also human. fairly dark, <laughs> you know. But that's sort of what I wanted to do with him. I don't know. I think it's human. Yeah. Mm. I mean, it comes down to the question: Would you? Would you? Uh, would you sacrifice your life for your child? Uh, I hope I never have to find out. Uh, <laughs> and but I, but I know that you know from like wars and stuff. Like yeah, some people do. Some people don't. Um, and we know who Roman is, uh, and uh, yeah, that was interesting to think about. Kind of horrifying. One final thing I'll say for Roshik, though, just to give you some closure, viewers, is perhaps he's not in some sort of limbo. I'll say that. Maybe he is somewhere uh-huh. specifically. Yeah. But that would be another story. Hmm. Yes. The uh, hint of him seeing something there in the distance through the storm also gave me that bit of hope thank you although we will be editing just a little your final sentence because your final sentence is what do you call it um i'm looking for like a not moss but like a mushroom a mushroom and i'm like oh is that your last sentence Litten. damn it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> I was really thinking, oh, come on, Hyama, this is your last thing. Don't tell us about how you go looking for... I was like, yeah, you find some food. God damn it, you find some food. (laughs) (laughs) I don't know, man. I don't know. Is it just... Him being practical, me being practical? It was. was I was like, I started... Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Um... (laughs) So what are we gonna what are we gonna say instead? Then? Oh no no no! You'll ha- I'm, I'll cut the la- he- I'm cutting the last part. You I'll, I'll have you say I go and try and look for some food, some lich and some moss. It was because yeah. the last bit where you couldn't find the words, you were like, it's what what you call it, like a uh, like a mushroom, <laughs> but not a mushroom. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so let us move on, coming to the end now. Let's go straight to highlights of the campaign. Let's say we've spoken a lot of things already, so let's maybe go for one, just one thing each. So one, Hjalma, a highlight, a character, a thing you did. Yeah, what was like a favourite moment, if you will? Um, it, well, funnily enough, things I look back on most fondly were probably the things Roshik enjoyed himself. I, I love thinking back on the calm transport episodes of drumming on the wagon. Uh, and, and sitting and writing by the pond, and also like drinking and feasting with the keepers of the feathers in the Vistani. I mean, there was so much, so many epic and big things that happened, but somehow that just felt cozy and nice and in character uh, to me. Awesome. Matthias. I really liked the scene by the lake with this uh, man who was sacrificing the Vistani children and uh, and then Roman deciding to, to kill him, uh, to kill him by hitting him in the back of the head when he was moving away. Because that felt like there was probably the darkest I went, um, just sort of killing uh, someone who's defenseless there. You, you know, not a nice person, granted, but uh, not necessarily doing it out of evil, but out of, you know... Yeah. trying to protect his people. Um, so then handling that in that way, I felt was, yeah, I got a little bit of a shudder, like, oh shit, am I really going to do this? And then uh, and then he did mm. it. And uh, that will stay with me for sure. Yeah, also how you did it for you, hit him in the back of the head. Yeah, exactly. It's not like the, the mm. honorable thing to do. Yes, that, that, was a, that was a good moment. I mean, oh, there were... 
so many moments and it's the classic thing when you're trying to think of just one in particular i mean i think yeah. for roshek i loved yeah all the moments he did little things like read his book or actually played an instrument and was so not like a fighter but yeah. i also really enjoyed every single one of his one-on-ones because god damn it he had a load he he killed Isaac, he killed Aragile, he killed Strahd, he killed uh, quite a few other guys in single combat. Often him in combat, Roman on the side healing and casting a guiding bolt. Um, and I loved yeah. all of those. Um, yeah. And I just liked how Rosh would say things really bluntly sometimes and people would laugh or get confused and then he'd move on very quickly. So he's like, your <laughs> village is a bit stupid. What? I mean, it's fine, really. And then you, that, you, never, you never kind of confront people. You kind of just went with the flow on those things. Yeah. It was great. Um, and also, your father, how you reacted to your visions. Uh, yeah. And just yeah, Roshnik's whole... The, whole... the fact that I gave you the quest and you went with it, and I was so expecting any time for you to be like, wait a minute, why am I being guided like this? This is all very convenient. No, you just yeah. accepted it, and it was great. It was like brilliant. I scribed you so many times. Yeah. <laughs> Never needs to make a saving roll against that. Although all it does, by the way, the scry spell is just that from your eyes, uh, Strahd could just see where you were and what was going on around you yeah. for a couple of seconds. Yeah. <laughs> With your hair, by the way. Wait. Oh, mm. from Madame Ava. Yes. Bastard! <laughs> I hate her so much. <laughs> and. Roman, all the times he kind of would come off really diplomatic, but almost be a bit smug about it. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? That it's like he's kind of like you always sound very. We've come to your village. We mean you no harm. And the indication being like, come on, don't fucking question us, all right? <laughs> like, people are just going to buy this immediately. Uh, every time you do it, it came across so sanctimonious, which exactly was the point of Roman being this sort of like sanctimonious. That front he put on, the front he put on of being in control, being deliberate with everything. Mm -hmm. So exactly. there was no way he was going to fail, because he can't fail. Lathander. Yeah. No, of course. <laughs> He's Lathander. He's on a holy mission. I loved him having his moment with the sun, like at that time you beat up the mob. And you were like, that, like you said, the, the only time you actually let yourself do what you wanted to do. It wasn't who you were, but in that dream you wanted to be defending your son you wanted to mm -hmm. give everything for him um yeah and then the parallel of that being when you beat him to death the wall the door because for roshek killing his father was kind of accepted you kind of almost didn't mean to do it and then you just did but with roman it was very deliberate you like oh shit you have to keep hitting him and you did Ugh. yeah Ugh. yeah and also for roman for, in fact, for both characters, I'll give them a nice a bit where they were nicer. For Roman, it was when he spoke with Esmer, um, Irina in the church. That time when they were taking her out of Valakai, I felt that was very genuine. Like, that point you thought you were doing good for her. Mm -hmm. She was a bit concerned, and you convinced her, and you convinced her in a nice way. Like, you actually believed you were helping her out. She believed you. and Because you did, why wouldn't she? You know, you were getting her out of a bad situation. And mm -hmm. for Roshek, it was... Um, yeah, how he felt about um, Bertie and how he felt about the mm. uh, vineyard people. I think that was, again, a moment where Roshek actually seemed to care about those people. Maybe because they were yeah. free, because they were doing their own thing and you respected it, maybe. That's what I got. Yeah, there were many things about mm. them. Uh, 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 to him, they, it's, it's, they seemed to have some sort of code that they lived by. Uh, and yes, they were free. They were fierce to protect their land, as I recorded in one of the intros now. Uh, and uh, quick to celebrate when they had a victory, you know. They they don't hold back on on having a good time, but they're very uh, determined in, in uh, defending their own and what they do. Yes. And st yeah, strong. Good old grandfather crow. Yeah. <laughs> he bonks you on the head. Yeah, yeah. Who hit him on the? Head. Yeah, yeah. They bonded quite well. Yeah, yeah, I'd say, I mean, the most natural thing would be... Uh, if Muriel hadn't been so dismissive, he Roshik would have definitely wanted to come with her. Hmm. Mm. And maybe close that one then on... You gave your highlights for yourselves. What were your highlights? Maybe what were the NPCs moments? Or what adventure moments stood out? 
as interesting or just memorable? Um, I think one thing, um, adventure moments, one that, that is, that I think I, I felt sort of the, the, the blood sort of rushing the most, uh, was really in the, uh, it was really the tower when we were destroying the heart. Mm. Um, I thought that that was mm. a really well thought out fight. It felt really tough and it felt like mm. we were really pushed to the edge um, and it felt like it was something that had a, a had a big impact. It felt like it could really have gone um, another way. Like we could really have failed that. Um, and so then getting through it felt like we'd really achieved something. So um, mm. that was that was a moment that felt really powerful and like like then leading up to sort of them finishing off the whole thing. It felt it felt really good. Mm. Yeah, yeah, that was really cool. Um, I, I would I would probably go back and, and say Kresik again. Mm -hmm. uh, everything that happened there, the uh, nuances and it, huge difference from a childbirth to a divine sort of fight. You know. That's currently mm. where I'm editing, actually. So it's very interesting. Ah. Oh, guys, yeah, no... Um, no, oh, they were just again. I, I, I personally really like. I, I, I really wanted the winter encounter to happen. You know, the, uh, the ghosts on the road and that sort of scaling the white mountain and you going down it. So I was really happy it did, and I was really happy how you acted through it, like Roman yeah. falling down in the snow for that moment there. Again, Roman just being a little more connected to his past, like the image of his son and his wife who hadn't mm -hmm. been appeared so much, yeah. and that made him stumble, while Roshek was a bit more, no, I, I, re I reject these dead people, I don't care, even though you know I'm stronger than that. Uh, yeah. I really liked that scene. Uh, I love Castle Ravenloft, yeah, I loved your meetings with the Count. Hell, even the very beginning, it's the very beginning, the first little wolf encounter, I thought set us up really well, how that was handled. Um... And the killing of um, the young vampire in the church. The first glimpse of um, Roman, if you will, not being the sack. Because up to that point, he was being a very good, lawful, good priest. And then that was the moment of, wait, is he always going to be lawful good? Maybe sometimes <laughs> he'll crush things and be happy about it. <laughs> they must be purged. <laughs> I <laughs> guess as we're running low on time, viewers, we'll finish with the last final part and we'll say goodnight. The final questions. So guys, yes, feel free. Ask me anything. What did that mean? Who are those people? Let's have one or two each and then we'll finish on that. So what was in Markovia's script? Um, the one that I didn't enter because I was convinced it was a trap that was going to kill me. So, first of all, there was a trap right in front of it. I can't <laughs> I don't it knew that. Probably just a spike <laughs> trap or a thing. Uh, in the actual crypt were the remains of St. Markovia. Specifically, one of her thigh bones. St. Markovia's thigh bone, which is a blessed bone that acts like a mace of disruption. Uh, but it will disintegrate once it hits a vampire. Hmm. Cool. So it would have been a fairly powerful weapon for a short time then. Potentially, yes. If I would have thought and to use a bonus I also weapon. would have thrown in a little bit of her actually speaking to you. Oh, at that point of the adventure. Is that the maze that uh, has a chance of dazing people? I dazing. think so. Or I think the yeah. disruption angle is that it's really good against um, maze of disruption. Very good against summon beings. Like I think they send them away hmm. easily. Hmm. So yeah, hmm. no, there was a trap. Okay. That's why it was open because of, but it was actually her tomb. Strahd hmm. had put her in there just to be a dick because he killed mm. her, obviously, when she came to try and take him out of the castle. But she did a good job of beating him up at the time. Such a vampire dick. Mm. He is. Dick vampire. Yes. <laughs> Yama? Uh, yes. I would like to know about the sun in uh, uh, Valakai. Ah, yes. The Baron's son. Uh, w would we have been able to have an interesting interaction with him? Could we have recruited him as a maid to our party that performed amazing magic feats? <laughs> Actually, exactly. He is one of the NPCs who um, the, the adventure randomizes who will help you the most. You got Esmeralda. She's always in the adventure, but she doesn't always have will be the chosen one to actually help you. Like She might have gone off and done her own thing a lot more, but she was chosen. In this case, uh, the son is also a companion. He 
is a mage. He is trying to research magical portals because he wants to get out of Barovia. So he's been oh, experimenting so with cool. magic circles. He is failing to do so. Uh, a bunch of people around the mansion have disappeared because he's accidentally got them killed and trying to help him test it. Uh, oh. He is a zombie uh, familiar cat. Little cat he's resurrected. No way. <laughs> Uh, and you go up to the the attic, which is where he does his thing. He's got a little trap on the door, so if you don't kind of announce you're coming in, you'll get zapped. And yeah, he's a son. He's annoyed with his family. He thinks his dad's an idiot. He just wants to get out of Barovia. He doesn't care about anyone else, really. And he just wants uh, to find out magic stuff. And that's why... Shit. The aftermath, they said there was an explosion of some kind. The explosion was yeah. as they were coming up to get him. They probably wouldn't have actually killed him. They killed the, hung the mayor and his wife, because, you know, why not? But they probably would have just taken him aside and kind of arrested him. Uh, he panicked uh, and tried to use his portal one last time, the result being a massive explosion. Cool. And his disappearance, then. Yes. Shit, I thought he was hanged, but okay, that somehow... Ah, oh, man, shit. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, Roshik was the one getting those hints, you know, about the y- l- purple flashes and stuff. Yes. Oh. And the and the, and what what's he doing? I don't know. Something about books. He reads stupid books. Stupid boy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think something about you know him sort of being an outsider really con- connects with me personally mm. on a personal level. It's like it was also oh, supposed shit. to be a bit of a uh, if you'd gone that way for Roman, because yeah. you can obviously see Roman there it was a son. Delving mm. in magical things that he shouldn't oh, be yeah. delving in. Mm. Oh yeah, that yeah. seems familiar. Mm. And uh, also working on portals to get out. Wow, we would have had a lot of things to talk about. Yes, I mean, unfortunately, he would never work because he didn't realize that a magic portal spell requires that both portals be drawn. You can't just draw one and the other. So wizards prepare in both locations portals, and then when they're both ready, you can use them. Rats. Well, well. Yes. Hmm. Okay. Well, I'm glad I asked, and at the same time not. But um, yes, okay. <laughs> That's you, very interesting to you, know. Do uh, you want to know about the baby? Oh, yeah, of course. That's because that's personal for him as well. It's not... This is not yeah. part of the main story. Yep. Nope. Yeah, exactly. This is totally main story stuff, so... So he was your half... Your brother. You killed him in the womb shortly before being born. You pushed forward first. He was strangled on the umbilical cord. Wow. So you did kill him. Maybe not deliberately, but you did kill him. <laughs> oh. And I had one necklace and he had the other one? Yep. Or would have had? He, nope. You, mu- your mum made both. You were given yeah. the first one, he was given his, and then he was burned as your tribe, I assume, did with burials. Uh, you obviously weren't told it, because why would you be told about that? Your mum was very upset about it. Hm. Yeah. Your father wow. knew, of course. Yeah. And that's why I was uh, disrespecting the dead, because I was wearing my brother's necklace. Yes. But... And do you know why Shit. it was your brother's necklace? Because in the Gothic Trinkets random table, which I really wish I'd rolled more viewers because there's so many fun little things, but I never kind of found the moment. The only time I found was when you were looking around at Kazan's two tower. That item is the necklace owned by your dead brother. Hmm. Is, it, is that, is that a roll on a table? Yeah, it's a roll on the table. Gothic Trinkets, there's a hundred of them. Hmm. <laughs> Oh wow! So it's that. just that. So did that come from there? Yes, it did. That you, I didn't have a brother in your mind before that. Nope. And then that happened. Wait, hang on a minute. Oh, and then I made that, up <laughs> and it was awesome. Oh, okay. <laughs> Shit. I also That's actually meant for you to the mirror to go to like I rolled twice because you were both supposed to have an item, but then <laughs> Roderick just sort of took the mirror and then never mentioned it again. <laughs> <laughs> That was the mirror that shows how they look 50 years in the future. Ah. I see. But he, yeah, so 50 years in the future, Roshik is miraculously still alive because half folks don't usually live that long. Mm. And he's got dark tendrils from his eyes. Yeah. Well, originally you just looked old, remember? The first time you looked at it, you just yes. looked like an old orc. It was the new Roshik. Exactly. Marked by the dark powers. 
Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, shit, man. That was nice. Okay, cool. And uh, now I know. Yep, and to flip it over, Roman, I mean, like, maybe you've already guessed, but do you want to know why you're Markovia? Go for it, man. So, Markovia's sister was your great-great-grandmother. She stayed in Beragost while St. Markovia went to the land that would become Barovia to build a chapel there and spread the good of Lathander and all that jazz. Mm-hmm. Your, uh, when Kazan became a lich, Strahd allowed him his one little bit of fun, because Strahd, of course, could let anyone leave when they wanted, as you gathered, and Kazan went to Alcaster to kill all those wizards who said he wasn't good enough. He did that, leading to the ruins of Alcaster, but then Beragost came and your great-great-grandmother sealed him away in blood because he was a lich and they couldn't find his phylactery, because, of course, it was in a completely different dimension, as is often common with phylacteries. So she did a very special ritual, sealing him in with the blood of your family for all time. Mm. The only way to break that bond would be for the blood to spill again, as your son did. Ah. By pure mistake. Wow. Yes, the foolish youth. Yes. Hence him summoning the lich. It killed a bunch of people and then went back home. Or rather, where its phylactery was, because it could do that. And then, of course, when it got back home, everything was different, and it was now servant. And all this happened only in your time a few months ago, remember, like a half Mm -hmm. a year ago. So it wasn't that... So in in terms of Barovia's timeline, he'd only been back for a little while, so... Oh, wait, did your son just die uh, half a year ago? It wasn't that long ago, was it? Um, no, it was not necessarily meant to be uh, to be that long ago. I don't know if we ever mm. settled on an exact timeline, but uh, it's been it's been a few. Uh, yeah, it's been a, maybe a year yeah. or, or a bit more. Yeah, mm. maybe a year or two. And time mm. outside goes a bit quicker than it goes in Barovia. Hence yeah. the uh, mm. line about you being missing for months, when actually the whole entire adventure probably only took over two weeks at most. Right. Maybe. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Mm. Different time. Yes. And there you go, and that's, that's why he hated you so much, because you fucking sealed him away for all time, and that's why he was an underpowered lich, because he'd been sealed away not having souls for a very long time. All right. Going oh, slowly mad, pleasant. because that's what happens to liches. That's yeah. very nicely put together, Craig. <laughs> well, I'm glad, but I kind of didn't want it to be obvious, and then as we finished, I was like, shit, was any of it obvious? Maybe it wasn't. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not I'm not smart enough, hmm. or Roshik isn't. You don't, well, I suppose I did, yeah. I, I, if I would have guessed for anything, I, I would have guessed that, yeah, he, he had a, an unborn brother. To be honest, it made I, sense I I, because you were a yeah. baby. That was the whole thing. You kept saying, I'd never done that. And that was the last thing I said was, are you sure? Because obviously the whole point mm. was you killed him the first seconds of your life. You don't remember that. <laughs> it was an accident. No. It wasn't deliberate. Or was it? Mm. And with Roman, of course, again, the problem was that Markovia, the ghost, didn't actually know that. Hence that final question. She was like, how did he come back? He said something about blood bonds. (laughs) Yeah. And Mm. then Roman didn't necessarily connect the dots there. Mm. I I gave you a check for that because I was thinking if you did well, like you would have. No, but Roman rolls bad on Dalton's uh, checks. He's uh, the stupidest priest alive. (laughs) That was great, by the way. That uh-huh. was such a funny thing. It meant also it meant it made sense. He never questioned much or thought about things too much because he wasn't actually that intelligent. Nope. No, he was yeah. not. Hmm. More a man of feeling. So, what feeling. do we think of those two? Rev- How do we feel about those revelations, then, guys? Yeah, that's um, that's a really um, it explains why uh, why things were the way that they were, and it. Um, yeah, it, it, I really like how the backstory sort of uh, entered into the main story in a very central way. Uh, I always enjoy mm. that. So, Thank you. I'm really glad that worked because it was the first thing we said session one. We were like, shit, backstory is going to be a bit different this time. So I really wanted it to be as relevant as it was in Cult, even though this entire adventure is supposed to be a fish out of water you're in a special bubble where only things there normally are first. So I may, you know, I bended things a little with Kazan there, but screw it. I'm happy with how it came out. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 I love that. I, I, I really like those things that you had in store there then. <laughs> wow. I will have to edit, though, coming soon. In the raw, you'll notice 
the first time you fled Kruzan, I do say something about the boy and how I ended the boy, which I obviously didn't do. I'll be cutting that line because later on I was like, no, he didn't kill the boy. He didn't kill the son there. He was hung. Damn. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. That's so, right. He just came out and basically did the typical lich thing of being summoned. You know, a lich, a lich cut off from souls for that long is supposed to, you know, be a bit like, ah, souls. <laughs> <laughs> Is that, do they feed on souls? Yes, it's as long as they replenish their phylactery with soul energy every now and again. That's how they basically can live for thousands of years and uh. be undead and be awesome. If they don't do it, they start losing their minds, and that's how they eventually become sometimes accident, an arch lich. By but an arch lich then doesn't remember what it was. They just become like a floating skull thing that's like souls, souls, that sort of thing. Hmm. I guess any final questions then, or are you, are you happy then? I feel pretty happy. I guess that sort of concludes it all. Yes. Mm. It feels... I'm not happy. <laughs> it feels a bit sad. Uh, but uh, it's beautiful. And nicely rounded off. Yes. yes. No, I definitely... I've said, viewers, that this to me felt an awful lot like if Cult, the end, felt like watching the credits of a film. Like dun, the credits rolling and that sort of feeling. This one to me felt like closing a book I've been reading for a while. Just the last page, mm. just like, poof. yeah, yeah. It sort of lingered a little bit longer, I think, and uh, yeah. But it's been uh, it's been a great journey, Craig, and uh, really well put yeah. together. And uh, it's been half a year of our lives, and uh, soon new adventures will begin. So uh, thank you so much for leading us through this uh, great journey. Yes, thank you so much, Craig. Oh. Thank you, guys. It really means a lot that you enjoyed it. Like I said, I did try my best, and uh, oh, I'm actually tearing up a little. There we go, I'm tearing up a little. Mm. Oh, there That's we go. Good. The feels. Mm. The feels. Must have the feels mm. in the postmortem. Yeah, I'm gonna miss it a bit. And the fun, and, and at the same time, I won't because we did it, and it's good. And and the mm. fun, and and the one thing I have learned is that I loved everything we did only thing I wish mm. I'd done more of I kind of wish I had had a little more D&D &D in there in terms of like the possibilities mm -hmm. because in playing for example the campaign I'm playing at the moment with some friends I have realised that sometimes the fun stuff can be really fun do you know what I mean like some of the rat not elves and dwarves and goblins but things like random floating heads that exist in a weird pyramid or or these weird fish folk yeah. and they have a weird civilization under the sea where they all eat each other like you know there's there's when you and luckily we're going to be doing that things like uh, some of the things we're doing in the future mm -hmm. exploring Definitely. more of what DD can be because it really can go anywhere and it can be really fun when it does <laughs> that's true <laughs> i look forward to it mm. yes indeed we and do. i'd also like to say guys Thank you so much for being amazing players. You totally did everything oh. I wanted. You made so many cool <laughs> moments. Uh, like the backstories you made made the adventure pop out in a unique fashion. No one else will have, well, I assume not Kazan doing that. No one else will have the cool brother thing going on. Yeah. yeah. It was great, mm. man. Oh. So. Mm, mm, mm. Real pleasure. Yes, it really was. And I suppose there we shall end it then. The end of Curse mm. of Strahd, viewers. The end of D&D &D for now. But who knows? Maybe there'll be some more around the corner. So, without further ado, I was Count Strahd von Zurovich. And I love you. Or rather, I love having you over for dinner. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Or rather, we would love playing drums for you. Go into the light. Go to the thunder. Guiding bolt. <laughs> <laughs> and I increase the radius of the light of the sword. Of course. Farewell, friends. And sleep well. Yes. Bye-bye.